and submit your own summer gaming moments, reactions, and plays, make sure to also leave us a yappa in the video comments of IGN.com, and you may just wind up on the show. That is it for this speed run, but we will be back at 5 o'clock for another. Also, make sure there's the there's the ticker right there. You can donate all day. Just because, just because I'm not here doesn't mean you can't donate. That's it for now, guys. It's time for IGN Expo number one. For the last one. Bye. Enjoy. Welcome to IGN Summer of Gaming Expo. We're rounding up brand new gameplay, next gen first looks, and got the developers to unpack the secrets behind their latest projects exclusively here on IGN. Fourth meal The Four Musketeers, Godfather 4. The number four is synonymous with an extra helping of goodness, so we couldn't help but wrap up our IGN Expo showcase with just three. It's time for the kick-ass post credit sequence you didn't know you were going to get, and today's helping is the biggest one yet. In addition to plenty of brand new trailers and announcements, we'll be getting hands-on with some highly anticipated games, like SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated, or The New World, Amazon's upcoming MMORPG. And those are only the titles we're allowed to mention. There's so much more we're intentionally hiding from you on purpose. <laughs> so strip down to your skivvies, crank up the heater, and throw some sand on the floor, because IGN's Summer of Gaming Expo 4 starts right now. is IGN Expo 4, part of IGN Summer of Gaming. We're about to showcase a ton of exclusive trailers and brand new gameplay. I'm Cindy Goodman, here with Max Scoville and Damon Hatfield. Thanks, Sid. Happy to kind of be here via webcam. You can watch all of our Summer of Gaming content wherever you stream IGN or live on your TVs by tuning into IGN 1 on your Samsung TV+. Plus. Also, all summer of gaming long, IGN is asking you to give to the World Health Organization and the Bail Project in support of Black Lives Matter. The COVID-19 Response Fund is dedicated to studying, tracking, and combating the coronavirus pandemic. The Bail Project is a nonprofit that pays bail for people in need, reuniting families, and restoring the presumption of innocence. And by donating, you'll have a chance to win codes for games like Resident Evil 3 or swag from companies like Bethesda. And donors who give more than $50 will have a chance to win a custom Summer of Gaming Xbox One X. Be sure to click the donation links in the description of your video player or go to donate.ign.com for more information on how and where to give. For even more Summer of Gaming goodness, download the TikTok app, follow IGN, and check out the IGN Summer of Gaming hashtag, where you can watch along with live events, submit your very own Summer of Gaming moments, reactions, and plays. Or leave us a yappa in the comment section of IGN.com, and your yap could wind up on the stream. Now, let's get the expo rolling with today's crop of fresh trailers, only here at IGN Expo 4.
have imagined it, our downfall, a thousand times. But it still breaks my heart to hear the truth of it. Take a look at this wondrous place. Complete strangers brought together by the fates to live out our days in a paradise we can never leave. And in all our time together, not a single crime has been committed. Our bond is as simple as it is terrifying. If even one person commits a sin here, every last one of us will die. We've come to call it the Golden Rule. Every moment we're walking on eggshells, and I have grown more and more afraid that our time in the sun is almost up. Someone is about to break the golden rule. I need you to talk to my people, help them win their trust, figure out who is about to end our lives. And by any means necessary, stop them. If all else fails and our darkest fears are realized, I will use my dying breath to give you a second chance. The fate of this city is in your hands. Fight Crab! Heck yeah! Later on today we'll be taking a real deep dive into all things Spongebob, the battle for Bikini Bottom, Rehydrated, hosting yet another charity speed run, and sharing a special Xbox One X update on smart delivery. Plus, our News Games and More crew will be sharing our IGN Icons interview with Tony Hawk, not to mention Chad Michael Collins of Sniper fame guesting tomorrow. That's all just around the corner, but right now, Tom Marks is going to give us a closer look at 30XX, a roguelike action platformer you can play with a friend. Tell us more, Tom. Welcome back to check out this game on IGN Summer of Gaming, highlighting exciting, under-the-radar games worth your attention. As a sequel to the excellent 20XX, the aptly named 30XX keeps the original's infinitely replayable roguelike Mega Man concept, but expands it in just about every way imaginable. Check out some exclusive new gameplay from 30XX's Clock Tower themed level. Like what you see? Then head on over to IGN.com or YouTube.com slash IGN to watch the full extended version of this gameplay. Under the Sea for a very exciting adventure with Martin Kreis from producer from THQ Nordic. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So we have you for a very exciting remaster that I know myself and so many people in this community are very excited for. We're going to talk about SpongeBob Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. Exactly. So it's the remake of the 
2003 classic uh, 3D platformer set in the SpongeBob universe. Probably, uh, or arguably, the most beloved SpongeBob game of all times. I mean, you're not gonna get any arguments from me. Um, did you guys anticipate the excitement for Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated? Because, like, it is kind of insane how. I know people in my office as well were just like freaking out. I mean, I know this is something that I played a lot as a kid and I adored this game and like hearing that it's coming back and like a gorgeous remaster like this is super exciting. Um, we did anticipate it to a degree. I think uh, on that level of excitement is always something you hope for, but not 100% anticipate because, um, you know, after all, it's, it's, a, it's a genre uh, that some may say that for adults isn't, you know, it's, it's not what, what you play regularly, but I think that's also the strength. There is not that many uh, 3D platformers out there on, on all these platforms, and it's just one of the best ones that was ever made. And there's just also not that much next-gen content uh, that features SpongeBob, and he's just one of the most beloved characters of all time. So I think this all came together to create this amazing momentum that we're this wave we're riding. And yeah, we're just very happy that the fans are happy, that the fans of the original, of the series, uh, that everybody's happy and excited. And looking forward yeah. to being able to give this to the players. I think one of the coolest things about this game too is that it, it really touches on a point in Spongebob history that everyone really loves and is fond of and of course kind of like the originals like Spongebob is still going and I know in previous interviews you guys said that you're trying to incorporate some of like the more modern art style as well and, and bring a little bit more vibrancy to this, correct? Uh, yes, so basically the game is from around season two um, so this is really the, the golden age where, where Stephen Hillenburg uh, was still uh, helming the series, uh, who unfortunately passed away, the creator of Spongebob. Um, and uh, we we updated, of course, the art style to the current, to the way that current also children uh, experience Spongebob. And we added little hints to newer uh, seasons, little, you know, like um, handsome Squidward or stuff like this. Uh, so <laughs> the classics, the classics from later uh, episodes, but the story and all the setting and everything is really from that time. And that's honestly just such like a great way to merge both fandoms. Um, I guess I like the older and the newer because you know the diehard old fans are just probably rewatching the first three or four seasons and then calling it a day. Um, but there's so much more to SpongeBob. I actually was watching it recently just to kind of like see like where's SpongeBob these days, and he's still in a really great place. So it's it's cool to see that you guys have found like really fun ways to integrate both. Um, so right now we are looking at this level, Downtown Bikini Bottom. It's really good to see it in all of its glory. Uh, so I'm actually originally from Texas, and I know we're not at the Texas part yet, or the Sandy part. So I was super excited to see her in action, and of course swinging on the little Texas symbols throughout the level. Um, what do you guys like about this level in particular? Well, um, first of all, uh, it's the first moment where you, as you say, uh, can actually experience Sandy um, with all her cool skills and her lasso and all this kind of stuff. Um, so this is actually also the first time we were, we're showing this in a big way. Um, and because she's basically, I think combat wise, she's probably the, the best character in the game with her lasso. She can lasso people from far away and all this kind of stuff. Um, so this is pretty exciting about it. And apart from that, it's also one of the most iconic locations because it's just this, it's downtown Bikini Bottom. So it's the, the houses that you just, you know, they're ingrained in your in your mind from watching the series. These are those typical metal houses that look a bit as if they were built from broken submarines and stuff like this. Um, and I think now with the higher fidelity of an Unreal Engine 4 of modern consoles and modern PCs, um, you can really, uh, it's, it's uh, on a whole different level, this kind of feeling of really walking through Bikini Bottom, like really walking through this world. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like even though it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one creation with all of like the episodes, because that downtown Bikini Bottom definitely changes between the episodes, um, it is nice to feel like that there are those iconic spots like that where uh, SpongeBob's hall monitor and you know, we got the wee woos in the corner in the dark. Like you can just like imagine where that would take place here. And it's really cool to see that. You said in previous interviews that Purple Lamp has dug into some of the cut content from the original and built it for rehydrated like the robust Squidward boss. What's the most exciting new addition? to Rehydrated? 
Well, I think overall it, it's the new multiplayer mode. So basically, we had we were kind of faced with this challenge of okay, how do you keep a, a, a beloved and revered classic the way it was, uh, and still try to bring back these things without them interfering with uh, the, the basic single player experience of the of that people remember. And so we basically took a lot of this cut content that was sometimes um, concept art or it was uh, 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 an unfinished level that you could you know, sneak into if you hacked the, the old game. And um, we took that and put it all into this multiplayer where two players can off and online play together as, as seven different characters from the SpongeBob universe and you just uh, fight against hordes and hordes of robots. So I think this is the, the, the biggest new feature by far because it basically includes a lot of little hints to all these um, cut content. For example, uh, Robo Squidward, who's basically your your boss in the multiplayer. I feel like that's such a great way to reincorporate those things. Like, again, to keep the fidelity of like that original feeling, like not to like really mess with the story too much, but to give something entirely new that doesn't really impact the core game. And I think that's such a great way to do that. Um, so the multiplayer is a horde mode. How hard is it? Um, well, it depends if uh, it depends on, um, it's, I think the thing is that it's, uh, it's about like 26 islands, if I have it correct in my mind. So it's, it's uh, quite a long challenge to get to the end. Um, and basically each island, it gets harder and harder at some point, Squidward, Robo Squidward starts attacking you and all these kind of things. So the first few islands are not going to be a big challenge for anybody who's, who's used to playing uh, these kind of video games, but it does progressively get harder and harder and harder. And to reach the la very last island, you do need to uh, have some stamina and some, um, yeah, some good skills. Uh, it's really cool that you guys brought in so many of the characters too. Who was the most difficult to design for multiplayer? Well, I have to speak for the developer there a little bit, but um, I think it's... Uh, since they all like they have all the uh, everybody has one normal attack and one bash attack, and then it was mainly also about deciding what kind of uh, like what kind of little differences are between the characters. For example, um, that Squidward it just made sense to give him a, a distance attack because we wanted him to fight with his uh, with his clarinet with his uh, oboe um, and. So it was more about actually the decision, where do we take uh, the animations, the, the fight, uh, the, the move set from. So Mr. Krabs fights with this swordfish skull from, from the episode where he's on that, on that cemetery. And uh, if you play Gary, which for me is the funniest one to play, um, <laughs> you grow this huge 50s uh, shoes that he sometimes has in the series, or he gets a, a frying pan in his mouth and you whack the robots with it. Um, so I think a lot of a lot of thought went into this to really make sure that even those little moves that you have in the multiplayer, that you recognize them from some of the uh, episodes, from the cult episodes. I love that. It's like she's really putting in that thought to make it something that's not just fun, but also really harkens to those really big moments or just like small details that you might have forgotten. And I, I just love that. It kind of just proves how much they care about SpongeBob, which is like kind of maybe weird to say, but like getting into those details for that just means I think a lot to the fans who will be probably playing this. Um, especially, I also think it's very funny that Squidward would fight with this clarinet, but it also makes sense. Um, I am actually a clarinet player as well, and Squidward kind of kills me even though I love him. And you know, I think it's fine that he's fighting with this clarinet, and if it gets destroyed along the way, it's probably okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, because the first instinct just from gaming perspective would maybe be to, you know, find the just coolest, most bombastic move. But then when you look at the series, there's so, so many little funny details, so many crazy details. And, and this kind of wackiness, I think, is what, what is, is part of why it's so beloved around the world. And so we basically then just realized it's just much funnier if you try to find something that people remember from a certain episode and that just, 
you know, you've, you're not gonna see in any other video game. You're not gonna see in any other game a little snail step, stomp on somebody with shiny <laughs> leather shoes. That can only happen to you in the world of, of uh, Bikini Bottom. That is absolutely true, and I love it. So I heard you guys brought Speedrunner Shift to play Rehydrated. What sort of feedback did you guys get from him from this? Yeah, basically he uh, he was kind enough to fly over to Vienna, where the studio and also THQ Nordic, we the publisher, uh, are based, and just um, play the game actually at the, at the stage it was back then with the developer and, and give his insights since nobody I think on the planet has played more Battle for Bikini Bottom. And he just knows so many shortcuts, so many little design choices, so many um, little uh, techniques how you can get around somewhere fast or what where you could actually also kind of fool the game and um so all of these things basically went into it and apart from that obviously he's also he just knows a lot about camera movement animation of just what since as a speedrunner you you know anything that kind of trips you up is a pain in the bikini bottom um mm -hmm. so those were basically the things that that he i think could uh, was able to contribute a lot and apart from that, uh, we just love watching his videos and, you know, seeing all the, uh, of him and the other guys of all the speedrunners out there and the fans to, to just see what they are excited about and whether we are concentrating on the right things or whether we were concentrating on the right things. That is so awesome. Thank you so much, Martin. We look forward to seeing so much worse. SpongeBob SquarePants, Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated, here soon. We have to take a quick break, but stay tuned for an inside look at the new game, New World's New Mode, War Mode. It's all new. We'll take an even closer look at Amazon's New World later on, plus we'll get our hands on SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom, rehydrated with an exclusive Let's Play, so if you liked what you just saw, there's more where that came from. It is a complete remaster of a beloved 3D platformer, and I, for one, can't wait. The ad break is a great time to donate to the Bail Project or COVID-19 Response Fund, which you can do at donate.ign.com or by following the links in the video description. By donating, you'll have a chance to win codes for games like Resident Evil 3 or swag from companies like Bethesda. Donors who give more than $50 will have a chance to win a custom Summer of Gaming Xbox One X. And don't forget to follow IGN on TikTok. You can search IGN Summer of Gaming hashtag for exclusive bonus clips and to upload your own best gameplay moments. That's all we got for right now. We'll be right back. IGN Summer of Gaming is presented by The Last of Us Part 2. Available June 19th. Rated M for Mature. By the Army National Guard, working in our communities throughout the COVID pandemic to deliver food, build hospitals, and more. Go to nationalguard.com slash esports for more info. And by Fuser, who will be parting with us all summer long. The next generation of video gaming is on the horizon, and iGen is here to bring you the latest PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X news and analysis in our new weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch 2020. We'll bring on the experts to discuss and analyze all the latest developments around these new consoles. From frame rates, services, features, peripherals, and even all the new tech jargon, Next Gen Console Watch 2020 will keep you up to speed on everything leading up to the next generation of gaming. Join us every Friday for a new episode. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, let's plays, and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app, YouTube, Facebook, or Snapchat, we've always got you covered. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. News, Games, and More is IGN's live news show every day of the week that covers all the day's news about games, movies, comics, and of course, more. This is our daily live show that takes a rotating cast of IGN talent, going over all the latest news of the day while taking live questions and comments from chat. We're live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, and you can find us on Mixer.com slash IGN, YouTube.com slash IGN, and Twitch.tv slash IGN. See you there.
If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. Welcome back to IGN's Expo number four. Do you remember when you do that? Oh wait, that wasn't, that's not four. It's fine. Uh, where we're premiering the latest game trailers and getting you first looks at fresh new gameplay like New World. New World is a game designed to be played with other people and war mode allows for epic 50v50 action. So we sent in Mitchell Salzman and Nick Lamone to fight for opposite sides of a 50v50 match. And let us know what it's like on the front lines. Let's play New World War Mode with Nick and Mitchell. Mitchell. Oh, I killed Mitchell. I sniped him. <laughs> Burning oil. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> what is up, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Mitchell Saltzman, joined by Nick Lamone. How's it going, everyone? And also, uh, Mike and David from Amazon Game Studios. Afternoon, everyone. What's up? And today, we're going to be doing a Let's Play of the War Mode in New World a game that's coming out rather soon, actually. So, uh, Mike, Dave, why don't you uh, give us a quick walkthrough of what this mode is? Yeah, so war mode is how we determine who owns a territory. So uh, when one uh, company owns a territory, another can declare war on it, and then they fight it out in a 30-minute battle. Uh, as an attacker, your goal is to first capture the three points around the fort. Uh, once those are captured, then you breach the walls uh, and then go in and try to capture the flag. So as a defender, we don't like Dave and his team doing that. So what we're going to try to do is prevent them from taking those capture points by setting up our own siege weaponry, which we set up through town projects and various other things. But we want to keep those up and we want to stop them at all costs from taking those points. Because if they take those points, then they'll be able to batter down our gates and then eventually try to take the fort itself. All right, and Nick and I are going to be on separate teams. We're going to be coached by Mike and Dave. Dave's going to be on my team. Uh, Mike is going to be on Nick's team, and Nick, I like you a lot. I just want to say that. I... Don't lie to me, Mitchell. No, no, this no is true. No need to lie on camera. This is true, Nick. I like you a lot, <laughs> but as much as I like you, <laughs> I like winning more, and I hope you're going to be okay with that. I hope we can still continue to be friends after this. We'll see. All right, so this time we're on the attacking side, uh, so you'll see once the gates open, now our job is to try to capture all three points to unlock the door. So. All right, I, I'm following you, David. So wherever you go, I will go with unless, and this is a very you know bolded unless. If I see Nick and his dumb little face, I'm a tanky boy. I, I, I I'm sorry. I'm, I'm gonna have to go and follow follow my heart. So what we want to do is defend the control points. Now we want gotcha. usually anti-infantry weapons. So basically, we'll want to use like the repeaters. Uh, we'll use the cannons and ballistas against uh, their siege weapons because that's what's going to do more of the structural damage. Where are you at? Let's see. I am at the very top of the structure. I see you. I'm dropping down. And so anytime we want to enter or exit a gate, uh, when it's when we're ready to go and we unleash hell, to war! we'll press E to open. Oh, I have to hit, I have to hit E. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm still following you. I'm still following you. All this right. is still good. Here we go. All right, don't be distracted. We're going to the point. All right, all right, all right. So as we stay on the point, we'll start to capture. Oh, wow, there's a lot of them on top of B. We got to get in there. Yeah, there is. All right, we're halfway there. Stay on point. Definitely need our heal healers up front. Oh, we lost B. All right, we got B. I'm going to tell the army to go for C now. So that means they can go through our main gate, right? Not yet, they need to take more control points. All right, head towards C, I'll meet you there. Head towards C. Oh God, I'm getting hit. Leave me alone. I'm gonna go to A since I don't see anyone there. All right, I'm heading towards you. Uh, I only see Healing a small up. handful. There's still people fighting around that main control point. That's fine. That's fine, let them do that. Oh, I keep missing my siphon on you. <laughs> <laughs> it's still helpful, it's still lady. helpful. Yeah. Ah. We're looking strong at C. A is looking pretty clear as well. They're too quiet though, I don't like it. <laughs> All right, 
Uh, I'm gonna buy some a couple inferno traps and place them around here. Okay, same. I'll do that as well. Oh. Doing There's good. so much going on right now. It's a quarter of the way. Okay, I see them coming to A. Okay, so you can't build directly in the circle, but you can build around it. Oh, All good right. melt, good melt. Their their bowman's down. I can't block uh. forever. Uh, oh, I got you. Oh, run, run, run. I'm running. Ah, nice. I'm right behind ah. you. You're safe. Okay. Drink a potion. One more, and then let's head towards A. All right, where's A? I'm just in front of you. Oh, they got C, so everyone on A. All right, good, good, good. We took that down. I'm going to A right now. If you need an auto run, just hit equals. I haven't Don't seen Nick tempted. anywhere yet. Yeah, unless we see Nick. Pack up, B space, snickerdoodle. Oh, uh, focus on nice shot. Uh. That one's almost dead. Ah, man, missed. Oh man, everyone's oh. raining down over here. It's getting wild. Leave me alone. Oh, backstabbers. It's Nick. Oh, Nick's killing me. <laughs> Help me. Where is he? I don't want to die to Nick. Drag him back over towards A. Drag him back over towards A. Come on, Nick. Full life. Uh -oh. You got nothing. Uh oh. Ooh. I'm getting wrecked right now. Okay, I'm retreating. Oh, he's running. Oh, you're running. Where are you running from? Going back. Oh no, I'm a dead sister. Oh, he's down. Where'd he go? Did I lose him? Right here. Oh, I just got a message. Killed Advent Nick. Ah, uh, I got taken out. All right, David oh. V, I'm taking this seriously now. As long as Mitchell didn't do it, it's fine. Well, it was worth it in the end, but I think I'm going down right here. I gotta run. Ow. Oh, I'll take it. I'll take it. David V got the last poke in. Oh, Dave? I'll remember that. Oh no, I'm down. Oh no. Alright, David V, I'm coming for you. This is what you get. There you go. Oh, he's there dead. you go. How do you like that, huh? Oh, oh no, killed by Advent Nick. Oh no! The retaliation. Alright, back in. Get Kill that fade. back line. True. Oh, I see Nick. Put him down a heel right here. Alright, up in the right corner of your screen, you'll see how many battle tokens you have. Uh, uh, 132. To, go ahead and buy some either uh, chase elixir, which is really good, or I'm sorry, cleansing elixir, just in case you get slowed. I'll try to hang back. If we can clear this guy out of here, I can try to put some siege damage on him. Oh, shoot. All right, I'm going to try to... Uh, I'm very close. All oh. right, fade down. Good, I need four more tokens to get another uh, siege barrel. Once you get a barrel, see if you can get up close by those weapons up top. Gotcha. We need to take yeah, those should... out. We just shoot these uh, powder kegs? Yeah, once they're right now, you can either shoot them or if you... or ignite them, like walking up to it and interacting with E, and then it'll it'll set down a timer. If you shoot them, it's like instantaneous. Fuse is lit. There you go. So do you think... Do you think I should be in the thick of it, or should I be hanging back and, and dropping just fireballs? Well, we need a mix. Uh, you can't capture it unless there's people on it. So right. uh, if you lay down fire, I'll hop on the point. All right, I'll try laying down some fire. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. That's a lot of fire. Ah. Oh, I see him. Oh, it's Nick. Go away. Come on. Oh, uh, he's retreating. <laughs> Leave me alone. I'm gunning specifically for him right now. Oh, oh dang it. Got him. Oh. I'm sorry, Mitchell. I had to do it. <laughs> Just like Nick. Come, at, come after someone who's already weak. I'm happy. Mitchell's gone. How much time do we have left? Uh, 14 minutes. We're a bit behind. We should be uh, working on the gates right now. So. Oh, man. A's not looking so good now. We seem to give them an inch. Time to breach. All right, so let's start from C. I see you. I'm coming to you. Yeah, help me get Simon War out of here. All right, get to those supply generators. Oh, yeah, I got to yeah. get back inside. Right, move on to the gate. So now we just have to put damage on this gate? Yep, put damage on the gate. And once this is clear, next time around, I'll bring up a cannon and build one to help take it down quicker. Okay. All right, I'm back in. Supply generator. 
got this. We got this. And also with your tokens, buy some Inferno Traps. Do I have any? Yes, I do. All right. Good call. So set up Inferno Traps next to, like, the, the entrances. Knock, knock, knock. You. They're all just trying to... Oh, my gosh. The side of our castle has so many Inferno Traps. I love it. I got to add one more just, just for posterity. Oh. Does this have ammo? Yeah. Burning oil. Here we go. Yeah! <laughs> oh no! Get a shot! Oh, there's Mitchell. Oh, I killed Mitchell! I sniped him! <laughs> oh! Victory! Hey, well done! <laughs> you can go rub that in Mitchell's face. David, be honest with me. Where did we go wrong? <laughs> in, in many, in many different me. places. Uh, what I'd like to to focus on, uh, though, is the number of times we killed Advent Nick. Uh, that was a positive. You know what? That's fair. I, I think we at least got him twice. I know he got me at least once. <laughs> Maybe more. I'm not going to give him any more credit, though. All right, David, we've changed a couple things up. We got smoked that first round. I've completely changed everything that I did last time. I went, I'm going for a melee class this time. I got a hammer. I got a sword. Uh, we're on offense. Uh, what else do you think we can do to, to try and shift the tide in our favor and at least tie it up? I think this time we're just going to stand on that point and anyone that enters the circle, we're going to jump on them and put the full force behind them. You know enter my circle. I like it. Don't forget to eat. Oh, yes. Thank you for the reminder. All right. Go and be. Out right, of which circle. one are we starting for? Are we going for A? I say, I say we go right down the middle again. That worked out well. Go to B. All right, going to B. Getting on the point. Getting on there. We need a lot of people on Get there. Get out of my circle! Oh, we almost have it. We almost have it. Oh, God. Uh, everything sucks. Yeah! Nice. There we go. All right, I'm going to C. Oh, they got it. Uh, Want to go to C? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, if they're going to C, then let's go A. A is looking rough, but I don't think we'd get there in time. Yeah, I think at this point we stay here. Yeah. Nice. All right, just to C now. Kanazia, why don't you come into my circle? Ooh, got a headshot there. Oh, man, there's a lot of them at C already. Ooh. Oh, don't say all in on C in general chat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to lead them. Got him. All right, I'm back on point. A lot of red people coming in. All right, I got Kenzie oh, wow. down. All right, uh, I'm going to go and get some anti-infantry weapon. So oh, we can try man. to take C. All righty. Going back on point. Oh, boy. Here it comes. Boom. Nice. Oh, I hit a ton oh, of people nice. on that one. Great. Yeah, look at that. Let him disperse. Where is Nick? Where's he hiding? I know. Why isn't he on the point? I got this guy also. Irish pride? Yeah. Reviving. Ah, I couldn't do it. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh, every time I try to get in on someone, I just get destroyed. I'm getting rocked right now. That last one's always the toughest. Oh yeah. Alright, we gotta get that uh, repeater right here. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna snick around to the right. Going for it. We need to fight on the circle. Fighting. Oh, man. Getting bullied. Oh, oh, is that Nick? Oh, I see Nick! Oh, no, Mitchell's got me. I can't let him kill me. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna get him. He's hiding in the fire. Oh, no, Mitchell's gonna get me. No. Oh, he's dead. I can taste it. Anyone but him. Oh, where are you going? Where are you going, Nick? Ah, uh, no, he's got me. No, I can't, I can't let that happen. <laughs> he's dancing on my body. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we can play that game. All right. Oh, God, I hope that didn't cost us the point. Uh, we're, we're losing it quick. Back <laughs> I'm on. back. I'm back. It was worth it. It was, it was worth, worth it. it. It was absolutely worth it. All right. Get on C. No one's here. We're starting to lose C. I may yeah. pull back if I were you. Oh, I see Mitchell. Oh, he's running. There you go. Oh, boy. Uh, oh, that's it for me. Fire everywhere. Hold strong. Oh, Almost no. got it. Almost got it. Get on circle. 
Oh no, it's going down! No! Alright, we're pushing him back. Oh, we were so close! Get off my point! Alright, it was looking dicey for a second there, but I think we got it. I think we're back. I'm gonna get the- they're building two of these. I got one of them, now I'm dead. Oh, I see it. I see Nick. Oh, it was Nick. Oh, and he's dancing! He's dancing oh, on my grave! Oh, <laughs> hey, guys. Stop that. Not looking good for the home team here. No, this is rough. So what's, what's like, the, the good the good combo that you guys mentioned earlier? It's, like, two slashes, shield bash, and then while they're stunned, uh, you can I... use a, a strong attack and then cancel that into something else? Yeah, if you've got the spin swipe, uh... Sorry, the spin stab. That's a great one to cancel the heavy into after the stun. I'm cheering about Nick's death here. Sorry. There we go. I like that. Do so you think we should retreat? You know, I'm going to try using the turrets a little bit. All right. Yeah. Give them a, a chance. Feel bad for old Mike and Nick. <laughs> oh, we did it. <laughs> It's a regular Christmas miracle. You know what? I don't feel anything because it's just... Oh, I feel Mitchell! I sniped him! <laughs> Karma as far as I'm concerned. I'm trying to go from behind. Oh, he's running, he's running. He's at a third health. All right, well, at this point, I'm going to go hunting. Oh, I see Nick! Oh, I see him! He's all the way at the back! He's, oh, on, a, he's on a cannon. Get in the ground where you belong! He's running, he's running! Where you running? And he's dead. Oh, <laughs> oh, perfect! Oh, how poetic that was! Well, you win one, you lose one. All right, guys. Well, that is war mode in New World. Nick, uh, we went one and one. So you know, I'm I'm glad at least, even if I didn't win, I'm glad that we we went neck and neck in there. Uh, and I just have to say, you know, you did great. And Mike, Dave, thank you guys so much for for being such excellent coaches. And Nick, Thank I am sorry for dancing on your grave. Yeah! <laughs> You're so mean, Mitchell! <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys, and we will see you next time. Bye bye. Bye. Now that you've seen what New World is all about, let's join Sid and one of the game's developers to find out more about this ambitious project from Amazon. And now we get to talk about a brand new game called New World. And here to talk to me about it, we've got Mike Willette and Dave Verifayi. Hi, guys. Welcome. How's Thanks, it going? Thanks, Great to be here on the Summer Gaming. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. So let's just start at the top. Let's, for people who don't know, what kind of game is New World? What can players expect when they get their hands on this? Yeah, New World is an open world MMO. It's set in the age of exploration in the 17th century on this beautiful but dangerous island called Eternum. It's got this great blend of directed content with quest chains and deep story, as well as lots of opportunity for emergent gameplay with open world systems like the territory control system, a player driven economy, housing. Uh, and underneath that all is this really cool action based combat system and deep progression. Uh, that sort of keeps the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay fun and engaging. Mm -hmm. And so how does New World set itself apart from other fantasy MMOs? I know you kind of started outlining some of the things, but if you want to get a little bit deeper, maybe into the combat aspect. Yeah, the action-based combat is, is a really cool element of the game. It's a, it's a system where skill really matters. Uh, positioning and timing is, is super important to the combat. It's a physical-based combat system, so your swings actually have to con connect with an enemy uh, to register a hit. Uh, there's also a lot of defensive options, so it creates this really sort of cool dance between the attacker and the defender where there's momentum uh, during the battle. And it's a, it's a really sort of strategic system also where your gear choices, how you sort of specialize your combat abilities all makes a big difference in, in how combat plays out. 
Mm -hmm. Now, how did you determine which typical MMO conventions to keep and what you and your team wanted to innovate on? Yeah, I think, you know, MMO players have certain expectations. I think a big part of the game that everyone likes is the sort of progression systems, uh, leveling up your character, uh, seeing that advancement of your character, both, you know, in terms of their abilities and their gear and all that. Uh, so those are parts that we really wanted to keep. Uh, we also like the sort of the stories that MMOs tell. And, and New World, I think, has, has some great story and quests behind it that, that Mike and his team have worked on a lot. He can dig into those. Uh, so those we really wanted to keep, but on top of it, we really wanted to add a little more open world uh, elements and opportunities for players to create their own uh, stories in the game. Uh, and that's where things like the territory control system where players can take over one of the 11 territories in the game uh, and sort of own that territory. They can set their own tax rates. Uh, they sort of act as governor of the territory and that creates really cool storylines where different people want to overthrow governors that they don't like. Uh, and the battles and wars that come out of it are, are really, uh, that's what we're seeing in the B-roll here right now, are some of the epic moments in the game, these large scale battles. Uh, they're 50 on 50 battles where one team is trying to uh, siege the fort while the other team is trying to push them back and hold off uh, in defense. Yeah, I'm so glad you referenced this B-roll because what we're watching is war mode, correct? Can you maybe tell us more about what exactly war mode is? Yeah, so war mode is how we determine who controls the territories in uh, New World. So uh, as, a, as a territory is, uh, when a territory is in a neutral position, we start something called influence race. Uh, what that means is there's three factions in the, in the game. And one of the uh, factions that doesn't own the territory can try to put the territory in a conflicted state by doing these PVP missions. So it's basically a race between the two factions that don't own the territory uh, to see who gets the right to declare war on that faction. Uh, and when that happens, uh, once the territory goes into a contested state, then we see uh, the war that actually is happening here. And this is a, a 30 minute war where it's a 50 on 50 experience. And there's sort of three general phases to it. Uh, the attacker's end goal is to take down the claim and you know basically lay siege to the, the fort. But before they do that, they first have to control these three control points that are spread throughout the territory. Uh, once they control all three, uh, then the attackers can try to break down the gates. Uh, and then the last step after they've broken down the gates is sort of spilling into the fort itself and trying to uh, take control of the, the central claim flag in the fort. And while all this is happening, the defenders are trying to stop them from doing this. Uh, what's cool about this is you'll see uh, right there on the screen one of these siege weapons, right? So it's a, a really cool blend of people on foot using melee weapons, using guns, using magic, and then these uh, huge siege weapons trying to control space and, and the flow of battle also. Yeah, man, that definitely looks like quite the weapon. I don't know that I would want to see that outside of my territory. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what, what kind of weapon? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, what you're seeing here is someone trying to take down the weaponry. So what these siege weapons become almost sort of like mini objectives on the battlefield where uh, the attackers can choose where to place them. So it's, it's sort of fun to find hidden places or places where you've got a really good sight line. And then the defenders uh, have to sort of come out and try to take them down before they do a lot of damage. So it's this cool sort of objectives and, and that people can put in, and trying to find them in a cat and mouse game around it is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Now, are there certain um, war weapons for war specific weapons for the defense side or the defending faction? Uh, absolutely. So the defenders uh, on top of their fort uh, in the bastions, you'll see they have a variety of siege weapons. And some of the cooler ones that only the defenders have uh, is this huge horn. And when it rings, it provides a buff to everyone on the defending team that makes them heal and makes them stronger. Uh, and it just creates a sort of cool visual when you hear the horn, everyone charges. Uh, it's sort of a, a really cool moment in war. Uh, they also have uh, vats of hot oil that they can drop down, flaming oil on the battlefield right under the doors. So those can be effective uh, in combat also. Those definitely sound very effective. <laughs> um, so, you were talking about the steps for preparing for war and how um, there's kind of missions or quests that maybe uh, you need to do in order to activate or start the war. Can you kind of take us through that? 
Absolutely. Uh, so there's there's two main elements. Uh, as the defender, one of the things you want to do is upgrade and build your fort. Uh, so as you own a territory and are trying to protect it, you can do what we call town projects, uh, which are uh, basically projects that the governor starts and then anyone in the territory can contribute to the progress of that. Uh, and various projects will upgrade the strength of your walls, will upgrade the strength of your defenses. Uh, so governors can sort of choose which elements of defense they want to work on first, and then it brings together the whole territory to uh, try to upgrade the, the town and get ready for war. Uh, so that's what the defenders are doing. Uh, and then, as I said, for the offensive side, it's sort of a race between the two factions to, to determine who gets the opportunity uh, to go to war, because everyone wants these territories. They're, they're highly sought after, they're limited in number, and if they're popular uh, and well run, you can make a lot of money from them. Uh, so the opposing factions both want to take these territories uh, and the influence race basically uh, is a race where both factions are doing missions. These are PVP missions, so you have to flag for, for PVP, which puts you at additional risk when you're doing them. Uh, and when you're flagged, you have to run these missions and basically the, the side that runs the, the missions most efficiently and gets the most done wins the race and then has the opportunity to declare war. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, um, Mike, now we've talked a lot about PvP. Can you tell us a little bit about the PvE elements of uh, New World? Sure. As Dave said, you know, as we've been developing thing, we, we do have lots of quests and missions that like take you out to explore elements of the world. Uh, but then we have lots of POIs that represent the different families that live on this mysterious island. So uh, the main groups that we have are the Corrupted, uh, which are the kind of like the evil red dudes that you see everywhere that are overrunning the <laughs> island and kind of the, the whole mission that you're kind of like undertaking is to fight back and discover what this mysterious group is all about. There's another faction known as the Lost, another one known as the Angry Earth. Uh, and all of these factions or these families like coexist in this island and you kind of like find lore and tidbits and go on missions and quests and then just explore the environment and different uh, POIs, like what's really going on here? And some of them are dynamic events. Uh, we have corrupted breaches. Uh, and I don't know if Dave alluded to it earlier, but we have something called invasions where forces actually come to assault your fort and, and try to take down your civilization. Jeez. Um, well, this is definitely not for the faint of heart. Um, but thank you so much for walking us through that. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have, um, but I love learning about all the nuances of war mode. Now, when can people get their hands on this? Uh, New World is going to be launching on August 25th, 2020. Uh, but if you want to get an early hands-on preview, if you pre-order now, you can join our closed beta on July 23rd. Well, there you go. People don't have to wait too, too long. It's coming up soon. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Not too um, but long. Thank you. Not too long. Thank you both so much for coming by. And if you want to watch more of that uh, 50 v 50 war mode, let's play. We'll have that up on IGN.com. So make sure you check that out. And Mike and Dave, thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. We've got to take another quick break, but stay tuned. We're just shy of learning all about Celesta Crown of the Magister, a Dungeons & Dragons inspired tactical RPG. And later, we're popping the hood on the Xbox Series X to see how smart delivery works. And you know, an ad break is a great time to donate to the Bail Project or COVID-19 Response Fund, which you can do at donate.ign.com or by following the links in the video description. By donating, you'll have a chance to win codes for games like Resident Evil 3 or swag from companies like Bethesda, and donors who give more than $50 will have a chance to win a custom Summer of Gaming Xbox One X. IGN Summer of Gaming continues right after this. IGN Summer of Gaming is presented by The Last of Us Part 2. Available June 19th, rated M for Mature. By the Army National Guard, working in our communities throughout the COVID pandemic to deliver food, build hospitals, and more. Go to nationalguard.com slash esports for more info. And by Fuser, who will be partying with us all summer long. Yeah, 
News, games, and more is IGN's live news show every day of the week that covers all the day's news about games, movies, comics, and of course, more. This is our daily live show that takes a rotating cast of IGN talent, going over all the latest news of the day while taking live questions and comments from chat. We're live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, and you can find us on Mixer.com slash IGN, YouTube.com slash IGN, and Twitch.tv slash IGN. See you there. The next generation of video gaming is on the horizon, and IGN is here to bring you the latest PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X news and analysis in our new weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch 2020. We'll bring on the experts to discuss and analyze all the latest developments around these new consoles. From frame rates, services, features, peripherals, and even all the new tech jargon, Next Gen Console Watch 2020 will keep you up to speed on everything leading up to the next generation of gaming. Join us every Friday for a new episode. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, let's plays, and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app, YouTube, Facebook, or Snapchat, we've always got you covered. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. Welcome back to IGN Summer of Gaming and IGN Expo number four. In a little while, Tom Marks will introduce us to Dead Static Drive, an atmospheric road trip across America set one month before the apocalypse. But first, Celesta Crown of the Magister is a tactical combat RPG that draws heavy from Dungeons and Dragons. Damon had a chance to chat with one of the developers. Let's go check it out. I'm Damon Hatfield, and I'm joined by Matthew Gerard. He's CEO and Creative Director at Tactical Adventures, and we're here Hello. to talk about and look at Celesta Crown of the Magister. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Actually, I would have loved to meet you at E3, but uh, well, we have to adapt to the new time, so yeah. let's, um, let's adjust and do something great with you today. Of course, that sounds amazing. Uh, Celesta is a classic tabletop RPG in video game form. Is that, is that accurate? I think it's pretty accurate, actually. We define ourselves as a tactical RPG, and uh, I've been a huge fan of tabletop gaming for uh, 30 years. Um, and uh, my, my vision was really to create, uh, recreate this feeling of tabletop in video games hmm. in something very faithful to the, the, the rules of uh, tabletop gaming. So um, uh, what we see behind is the footage of the, of the, the game, which we're going to uh, release as a demo for the, the Steam Festival. And right. um, what's really um, interesting about the game is that we use the D&D 5th edition rule sets. We have a license from Wizard of the Coast. And the game is very accurate to the rule set. Uh, and people who are fans of, uh, of D&D will find, uh, find uh, themselves uh, right at home with this game because you will find all the classical races, classes, backgrounds, powers, features that you used to. But also, um, the game um, has its own universe called Celesta. And uh, mm -hmm. so we added our own races, classes, and special content. So people that are familiar with Dungeons & Dragons uh, should be, feel very familiar to them. But what about people who haven't played D&D? Well, I would say that the fifth edition is a very good balance between uh, simplicity and customization options. So it's not the mm -hmm. most complex of editions. And also we have lots of tutorials and introduction sequences. And mm -hmm. uh, again, also the, the interface is really streamlined so that it's easy, natural, and, 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 and fun to use. So here I think we're seeing, uh, we're rolling a character. Yes, absolutely. You have the different stages of the, the character, uh, race, class, lots of options. For the background, you can also customize your personality. That is the at the bottom left, you can see the personality flags, which will define how the character reacts 
during the, the cutscenes. And also what is really interesting in the game is that you play a team of four characters, not just one plus henchmen. So you're going to create a full party of four characters with complementary skills, powers, abilities. So it's really, um, you're going to take advantage of all the rules at the same time when building a party. So you, you create your characters, create your party, but what's the sort of overall story that you're telling here? So the story is, uh, it's um, a story, uh, it's an epic story of saving the world in Solasta. So Solasta is an ancient universe. Um, in this world, um, the, 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 um, the kingdom of the elves was destroyed by a cataclysm. Mm -hmm. Shortly after the humans came from another world, another dimension. And somehow after this cataclysm, the, the world reconstructed, but there's some pretty bad stuff going on in the, the area called the Badlands. And the, the main um, goal of the, the player in the campaign will be to find out what's happening, which ancient evil is appearing. And so his party of four characters is going to meet different NPCs, monsters, dangers, strange fortresses, all of that exploring uh, the world of Solasta. And actually it's one of the goals uh, of this game is to discover the lore and the, the specificity of Celesta. So I think we're seeing some uh, combat here, and I think you've put a lot of work into uh, making dynamic environments and also vertical environments for combat, is that right? Yes, yes, because I'm, again, I'm a big fan of D&D uh, &D rule sets, and uh, I think sometimes it was overlooked the fact of having the ability to use torches, light sources, or darkness spells, and also sometimes flying around, levitating. So we, we've put, um, uh, a huge effort in uh, in uh, simulating um, a cubic world made of cubes, like Minecraft somehow, which allows us to have all these different um, uh, motion mode and also uh, lighting simulation, depriving the enemy of his senses. Even some enemies are afraid of light and can be uh, it can be used as a weapon. So, really, the environment it's um, it's useful. You can shove enemies uh, uh, from a platform. You can knock them down. You have lots of options, and it's not only um, um, using a long sword or a firing a, a fireball. It's really a, hmm. a very deep turn-based, cell-based game that we built. Yeah, I appreciate the fact that you can sort of knock enemies around the environment. Uh, certain parts of the environment can be destroyed. So it seems like you're going to have a lot of options, different ways to approach combat. And scenarios. you have interactions when you cast a, a burning hand spell, you're going to light torches or a, hmm. uh, you can have stuff which explodes, etc. So there's a a lot of interaction between you, monsters, objects in the game, in exploration as well as in combat as well. So the the four characters that you create at the beginning of the game, are they in your party the entire time? So it's not a situation where as you travel around, you're meeting new people who are joining your party? No, it's your party. So again, I, I want to reconvey the feeling of uh, tabletop where you have this party of four characters interact together, doing the full adventure together. Uh, so if one of them dies, obviously you'll have to find a way to revive him or her and there's lots of options to do that, but you cannot change the character uh, because it's, uh, it's his or her adventure and he has to stay with the team the full game. Sure. So as you were mentioning, uh, uh, Wizards of the Coast granted you the license to use the D&D uh, 5.1 &D rule set. Is that unusual uh, for, I, I guess I can't think of a lot of other examples of video games that are using the official rule set. Actually, I don't know. Uh, to my knowledge, we're the only one, but uh, I'm, I'm yeah. not sure about that. So. It's, it's a great opportunity because um, the, the SRD, the System Reference Documents, it's a huge PDF file of 400 pages with all the classes, spells, races, magical mm -hmm. item monsters. It's huge. Of course, you don't have the copyright content like uh, the universities or the, the heroes, but sure. uh, it's still a, a huge content. Yeah. And very so what familiar to what people are using. Sorry. No, it's OK. Uh, are we seeing some sort of exploration here? Yes, so exploration is a uh, real time in the game. So you will have your allot uh, allotment of traps, uh, uh, magical puzzles, uh, hidden uh, uh, dangers, etc. Lot uh, you have some looting. You can detect magic on objects, identify them. All of what you would expect in a in a full fledged uh, RPG game. Uh, each character has its own advantages. So when you're going to inspect a strange totem or a, or a statue. Uh, the one with the highest history score is going to do the check. Uh, when you want to um, disarm a trap, the rogue obviously is going to be more, more effective. But what is really 
uh, interesting in the game is that you are completely free to create the party you want. And it's actually a treat for us because if the player wants to make four halfling fighters for the whole game, he can. It's not the best thing he or she could do, <laughs> but it's a possibility. So again, the, the game is reacting during the cutscene, during the combat, etc., during the uh, uh, exploration to whatever the party has selected to have in his party. So it's, it's a big challenge, but actually the, 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 the benefit is that when you replay the game, you will have different uh, dialogue lines or interactions uh, well, mm -hmm. with your party. And it looks like uh, those dynamic environments that we see in combat also apply to the exploration, where they, they pushed a rock off a ledge, created a, a new yes. pathway for them, right? Yes, and you can see on the screen uh, spiders crawling on the, on, the, on the walls. So obviously this is about for the monsters, but when you, you find some uh, high-level spells like Spider Climb, you can do that yourself, so it's very cool. And uh, well, it's been a nightmare, of course, for the engineers to program all the <laughs> mathematics to, to do that. But it's, it's sure. super fun, and if you hit someone, it's going to fall from the wall. Uh, so it's, there's lots of uh, interactions and, 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 and fun stuff going on because we, we went, I don't know, maybe like 95% in implementing the rules. Uh, so mm -hmm. not because we're fanatics, but just because it makes a, a, a more fun game. So the uh, demo will be available via the Steam Festival. Yes. Uh, and so what does the demo include? So the demo includes the new uh, character creator, so with all the options to create a level one character. So you can play around and create all the crazy characters you, you want. There's several uh, option methods to do that. So uh, I hope it's going to appeal to all the fans. And on top of that, we also are um, um, rebooting the Kickstarter demo, which we proposed mm. uh, a few months ago, except it's going mm -hmm. to have the new gameplay, new game mechanics and art and stuff. So it's almost another game and, and people can show our progress and see uh, what the, the game can offer. So we have both the character creation and again, uh, one hour of gameplay uh, to, to check out. Very cool. Well, I can't wait to check out the demo. Thank you so much, Matthew. Salasa Crown of the Magister looks very cool and we look forward to learning more in the future. So these are the ruins of Telema? Imagine the wonders that await us inside. Welcome back to check out this game on IGN's Summer of Gaming, highlighting exciting, under-the-radar games worth your attention. This next one is called Dead Static Drive, a survival adventure game about driving, scavenging, and fighting your way through a world full of nightmarish monsters. Here's some exclusive new gameplay. You just watched an interview on Celasta, Crown of the Magister, and then Tom told us all about Dead Static Drive. Later on, we've got Destroy All Humans gameplay and an exclusive week early hands-on with SpongeBob SquarePants, Battle for Bikini Bottom, Rehydrated, very long title, another speedrun charity drive with the original SpongeBob game, Tony Hawk, 
the actual skater, and much, much more. Right now, Miranda Sanchez is going to tell us all about Scarlet Nexus, along with one of the game's developers. So hold on to your brains, because the others are coming. And here's Miranda to explain whatever that means. Here to talk about Scarlet Nexus with me is game director Kenji Anabuki, producer Keita Izuka, and translator Yuji Moria. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Hey, how's it going? Hey, today, eh, to interview, よろしくお願いします。よろしくお願いします。Thank you guys for so much.、Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. This is a super exciting property. Next Gen is on the front of everyone's mind, especially mine. Like, we are so excited.、Um, and we're so excited to see more of Scarlet Nexus. So, first things, let's hit off with what were the most exciting things to develop for with Scarlet Nexus with Next Gen power in mind? Whether it were gameplay or features or just the graphics, what was the most exciting thing when you're ever developing Scarlet Nexus? えっと、スカレット・ディクサス、えっと、みんな楽しみにしてて、まあ、あの次世代コンソールも出る中でみんな、えー、注目の作品なんですけれども、と今回そのスカレット・ディクサスの、えー、開発において、まあえーまあ、次世代コンソールに向けた開発になったと思うんですけど、その、えー、過程の中でなんか一番、えー、エキサイティングだったこととか、一番楽しかったこと、えー、その次世代、えー、コンソールのに向けた、えー、開発がの中で何が一番楽しかったでしょうか。はい、そうですね、今回、この、まあ、新規タイトルとして、スカレット・ネクサス開発していく中で、ですねやっぱりその次のハード、世代のハードに合わせてやっぱ展開していけるっていうのは、まあ、非常にやっぱり我々としても、まあ、楽しみでありました。で今ままさにその開発中ではありますけれども、まあ、やっぱりそのハードの性能を生かした形で、より良いこの、まあ、RPG としての体験ですね、を提供していけるんじゃないかなと思っています。Yeah, so we're very, very excited to be developing for this new,、uh, you know, hardware, new specs, and everything. And yeah, I think we will be able to bring a new sort of experience of RPGs with this new、uh, console and hardware. Okay, what are some of like the most exciting features that you think will elevate RPGs with this new hardware? まあ、具体的になんかどういった、えーまあ、フィーチャーとか見どころがありますでしょうか、この新しい、えーまあ、ハードがあるからこその、えー、なんか表現というか、体験というのはどこにあるんでしょうか、まあ、やっぱりその、まあ、今回その、まあ、グラフィックの面でもです、ねあのまあ、このアニメスタイルでありながら、まあ、あの高解像度で。作っていってますので、もうこのキャラクター表現ですとか、あとはもう単純に、やはりまあ場面の移り変わりっていうのをシームレスに体験していただけるんじゃないかなと思いますので、まあ、そういったところで、この RPG としてのストーリーへの突入感ですね、そういったところが非常に強化されてくるんじゃないかなと思います。Yeah, so I think definitely the enhanced graphics will、uh... Be something that will enhance the experience of、uh, the RPG, especially with this particular game. It has that sort of anime style artwork to it, so it'll be really interesting to see how that will play out in the new hardware.、Uh, we're also looking forward to a lot of the seamless、uh, changes between scenes and cutscenes,、um, and we're also looking forward to just the, the more、uh, the, the intensity and what's the word I'm looking for.、Uh, Uh, like, what's the word? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I, I forget. But yeah, it's, the, the, the experience will be more,、uh, you know, realistic、uh, and more deep in that way.、Mm, got it. So, Scarlet Nexus will be available for the current generation of consoles for the Xbox One and PS4, and, but also for next gen. So, will those versions differ in any sort of way? Or any sort of significant way, I guess? まあ、今回その、現コンソール、まあ、PS4 と PS5、両方ともリリースということなんですけれども、そこのまあ両方の違いというところはど、どういうところに、えー、来るんでしょうか、えー、とそうですね、えーまあ、基本的にはやはり皆さん、この、まあ、ハードによらず、えーまあ、体験としては同じ体験をしていただきたいというところはベースになります。その中で、この次世代に向けた、まあ多分それぞれ。
新しいサービスとかも始まってくるかなと思いますので、まあ、それに合わせた形で、えー、まあ最適な形で楽しんでいただけるというところを目指して作っていきます、ね。Oh, sorry. The, the word I forgot in the previous bit was immersion. Sorry about that. i m m e r s i v e n e s s Yeah, so basically for Scarlet Nexus,、uh, we want both owners of the PS4 and PS5 to have relatively the same experience in terms of the game.、Uh, but we imagine that the PS5 will come with its own sort of、uh, unique services.、Uh, so I think the difference will come、uh, in that regard、uh, the interaction between、uh, the different,、uh, within the new PS5 features and services. Okay, well, I definitely can't wait to hear what those are eventually. But <laughs>、uh, Anabuki san, so I have a question just for you. You've been involved with a few of the great games from the Tales series. What sort of similarities, if any, does Scarlet Nexus share with those? えー、と次の質問は穴吹さんに質問なんですけれども、はいまあ、ティールズシリーズに関わっていたということで、まあ、あの今回、スカーレット・ニキサスとその、まあ、ティールズシリーズのなんかストーリー、なんかえーまあ、同じようなところがあるとか、なんか接点とか、そういったところはあるんでしょうかあお話においてはもう完全に新しいものなので、つながりとかはないですね。はいあのまあ、テイルズオブの,あの開発の知見とかはもちろん生かされているんですけど、ストーリーは全く別物で、全く別の新しいゲームとなっております。Yeah, so the game itself, Scarlet Nexus, has no real connection story wise to any of the Tales、uh, you know, RPG series, but、uh, the staff members are there.、Um, so I guess the spirit of you know, the Tales is there, but in terms of you know, the story or any of the, the world settings, have no relation to、uh, each other. Got it. So I've read that this is a fast paced action game, but there's a strategic element involved. Can you explain that a little bit? えっとまあ、このゲーム、すごい、えっとまあ、スピーディーなファーストアクション、ファーストピースな、えー、アクションゲームっていうのを聞いてるんですけれども、あのまあ、それに、それかつ、なんかいろいろとなんか攻略性があったりとか、そういった面も、えー、濃いっていうふうに聞いたんですけど、その面についてちょっと、えー、お聞かせください。はい、こちらもあるんですね。あ、はい。<笑>あのー、はい。どこまで言っていいのかなあのもちろんアクションゲームとしてあのこだわりを持って作ってます。あのテールドームの開発のノウハウを、まあ、生かしながらあの簡単操作でかつその誰でも爽快感が得られるようなアクションになっております。かつその、まあ、各会に対してその、まあ、いろんな超能力を使いながら攻略できるってところにはあのこだわりを持って作らせていただいております。Yeah, so we did put a lot of emphasis, as you mentioned,、uh, in the sort of action elements of the game. And、uh, the staff,、uh, you know, the guys who worked on Tales、uh, also are using the experience that they've learned from developing Tales games、uh, into developing、uh, something that is very simple yet.、Uh, You know, it really feels good. It's, it's,、uh, it feels crisp and intuitive in terms of the action、uh, controls.、Uh, but the strategic side will come、uh, mainly in battling、uh, what's called the others、um, in the game. So these are the main enemies that you will encounter、uh, in the game. Got it. あのフィーチャーしてお見せしてますけれども、まあ、それがやっぱり今回のアクションの,あの中心に来る、えー、ゲームシステムになりますが、まあ、この念力でできること、動かせることっていうのが、まあ、これからちょっといろいろバリエーションをお見せしていければなと思いますので、まあ、そういったところを使いこなして、えー、適応度を倒していくというところを、えー、楽しんでいただけるんじゃないかなと思います。And then Izuka san just added that、uh, in the trailer, we,、uh, there's a feature of、uh, you'll see a lot of psych psychokinesis and psionic abilities taking place. And that will be a big part of the action and、uh, strategy of the game. So that's something that、uh, we look forward to sharing more information as the time goes by. Yeah,、uh, that trailer was super cool. I saw him about ready to swing a train at some enemies. That looks very neat, and I'm excited to see that in action. So, when can we expect to see more of Scarlet Nexus? まあ、これからスカーレットニキサスに関しての情報の展開なんですけども、これからまあいつまた次はいつ頃新情報を期待できそうですか
、えー、そうですね、まあ、続々とこれから出していきますので、<笑>皆さんお待ちいただければと思います。はい<笑> Uh, we can't tell you any specific dates, but、uh, yeah, we'll be trickling down some information to you guys. So、uh, be sure to catch it when you get it. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm definitely looking forward to it. Thank you guys all so much for coming in and having this interview. Thank you for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back after a quick break with some exclusive gameplay for side scrolling sword fighter. Shing! Don't forget, the ad break is a great time to donate to the COVID 19 response fund and the bail project all summer of gaming long at donate.ign.com or by following the links in the video description. All donations go to combat the spread of COVID and reunite families in need who've been separated by mass incarceration. And by donating, you'll have a chance to win codes for games like Resident Evil 3 or swag from companies like Bethesda. And donors who give more than 50 bucks will have a chance to win a custom Summer of Gaming Xbox One X. And make sure to follow IGN on TikTok and search IGN Summer of Gaming hashtag for exclusive bonus content and to join the conversation. That's all the stuff we're going to tell you to do right now. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. IGN Summer of Gaming is presented by The Last of Us Part 2, available June 19th. Rated M for mature. By the Army National Guard, working in our communities throughout the COVID pandemic to deliver food, build hospitals, and more. Go to nationalguard.com slash esports for more info. And by Fuser, who will be partying with us all summer long. News, Games, and More is IGN's live news show every day of the week that covers all the day's news about games, movies, comics, and of course, more. This is our daily live show that takes a rotating cast of IGN talent, going over all the latest news of the day while taking live questions and comments from chat. We're live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, and you can find us on Mixer.com slash IGN, YouTube.com slash IGN, and Twitch.tv slash IGN. See you there. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. Everybody loves watching a speedrun of their favorite game. But what if you got the opportunity to peek into the minds of the developers while they watch their games getting completely wrecked? That's exactly what happens in every episode of Game Devs React to speedruns. Yeah, you can do that. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. We invite you to ride along with the developers as they react to, question, and enjoy some of the most skilled players exploiting and speeding through a game it took years of their life to create. Join us every Saturday for a new episode. The next generation of video gaming is on the horizon, and iGen is here to bring you the latest PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X news and analysis in our new weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch 2020. We'll bring on the experts to discuss and analyze all the latest developments around these new consoles. From frame rates, services, features, peripherals, and even all the new tech jargon, Next Gen Console Watch 2020 will keep you up to speed on everything leading up to the next generation of gaming. Join us every Friday for a new episode. As promised, we are back with more IGN Expo 4 on IGN Summer of Gaming, and we're talking all about Shing. What is Shing? Well, it's a demon slashing beat em up and the sound my blade makes when it thirsts for blood. But right now, we're talking about the beat em up. How does Shing play? Well, there's only one way to find out. Actually, there's probably a few ways, but here's the one we chose exclusive gameplay footage. Hi guys, Greg from Mass Creation here to give you a short gameplay breakdown of our upcoming game, Shing. At first glance, Shing seems like an old school arcade beat em up. And well, 
that was the idea. But as huge fans of the genre, we played and tinkered with the formula and created a beat em up that's faster, more reactive, gives you a wide range of attacks, defensive moves and buffs. Seems complicated? Well, it's not. Thanks to our unique control scheme. In Shink, you perform attacks with flicks and spins of the right analog stick. Yeah, that's right, the right stick. As you move the stick, your characters perform attacks that mimic that movement, giving you instant access to all sorts of attacks. From angled slashes, uppercuts and spins, to aerial combos, drop attacks and special moves. Another cool feature is character switching. Using the D-pad you can switch characters at any time. They don't share health bars, so you can treat them like 4 lives at your disposal. Switching is available in co-op as well, so we can exchange characters when you play with friends. Hi there! That's right, there's drop-in, drop-out co-op for up to 4 players. Back to switching. You can use it to extend combos, revive fallen characters or conserve buffs for later use. Right, buffs. You've probably noticed that some enemies drop glowing orbs when they die. Buffs or power-ups give you all kinds of extra abilities, both passive and active. These abilities are designed not only to increase the on-screen mayhem, but to give you extra tactical options you can use to counter all kinds of enemy skills. Talking about skilled enemies, here's a perfect example. Fencer will punish players who are too passive or too predictable. To break his guard, you need to mix up your attacks, quickly react to his counterattacks, and respect the rules of one-on-one -on -one duel, because he will punish anyone who tries to interfere. Throughout your adventure, you will encounter all kinds of enemies with different skills, each with multiple ways to defeat them. It's a perfect opportunity to talk about something that almost never exists in beat em ups defense. Best defense is good offense. Doesn't always apply in Ching. Sometimes the best offense is good defense. You can block and parry incoming attacks. Blocking is easier, but your guard can break if you take too many hits. Parrying requires good timing, but a successful parry will negate all damage and unleash a powerful counterattack. Or, if you parry projectiles, fireballs, arrows or grenades, a parry will send them back to where they came from. Those returned projectiles can deal extra damage, break shields or send whole groups of enemies flying, opening them up for juggle combos. And all that in cool anime-inspired graphics with tons of slick animations and special effects. All the technical tricks we had to pull off to achieve that OG arcade feel of the visuals are huge subjects for another time. Instead, let's talk about another important ingredient of any good beat-em-up, music. Good beat-em-up soundtrack not only gives each stage a unique mood, but most importantly gets you in the right rhythm during the fight. With good music, beat-em-ups can feel like rhythm games. There's this magical moment when you start attacking to the beat and realize that you're dancing with your enemies. What else? Cool characters? Check. Cheesy one-liners and bad jokes? Check. Environment storytelling? Check. Bosses? Oh yeah, bosses. You may have noticed a shadow lurking in the background watching our heroes every step of the way? Like in every good drama, it foretells a big event that is about to happen. But before that, let's take a short detour. Throughout the stages, you will encounter all sorts of interactive doors. These will take you to optional challenge rooms, which will test your skills in various ultra-hard scenarios. Or they might lead to so-called lore rooms, where you can spend some time with the characters and get to know them better or learn something about the world they live in. And the boss. Shink's stage bosses are the summary of the level. Like an exam at the end of the school year. They test everything you've learned so far, and each one is unique. So. If you're looking for a fast pace, intense beat em up action to play solo or with friends, Shing is your game. Thanks for watching, Greg signing off.
You're watching IGN Summer of Gaming. Later on, we've got a SpongeBob stream and a look into Xbox Smart Delivery. Plus an interview with Tony Hawk at the end of the day, but right now, some info on the Forgotten City. The Forgotten City started out as a Skyrim mod before becoming so popular that the developers decided to spin it off as a brand new game of its own. Here's Max and one of the developers to take a tour of the Forgotten City. The Forgotten City began as a Skyrim mod, which won awards and was downloaded millions of times. Uh, and now it is becoming a standalone game. Here to tell us about it from Modern Story, we have writer and studio director Nick Pierce. Nick, welcome. Hi, how's it going? D going just fine. Uh, the Forgotten City has been in the works for quite some time. It's, uh, it, is a, it is a narrative, interactive, explorable world. Uh, can you just kind of give us the explanation of what's going on here? Sure. So it's an open world murder mystery caught, uh, it's set in an ancient Roman city caught in a time loop. Um, and as you say, it's a, it's a standalone reimagining of a mod uh, that won a National Writers Guild award and wrecked up millions of downloads. Um, in it, the player discovers the ruins of an ancient Roman city, travels back in time 2000 years and investigates what caused it and tries to stop the city's destruction. Now, can you uh, give us a little bit of a kind of a, a guide of, or an idea of what the gameplay is like? Is it is it predominantly just sort of talking to people or is it solving puzzles? Is there any is there any combat? Sure. So there's there's a, all of that. Uh, so predominantly it's a it's a, a murder mystery. So the player will be doing a lot of investigation and exploration and talking to people. Um, the dialogue has uh, lots of branching narrative and, uh, and, and opportunities to role play. Um, and then of course there are puzzle and combat elements as well. Although certainly the focus is on investigation and exploration. Now, obviously a murder mystery has a certain amount of sort of twists and turns to it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how much the standalone <laughs> game might differ from the mod for anybody who, who might've played the original uh, and is, you I think that every aspect of the game has been leveled up. So, um, so it has a new setting, a new engine. We're using Unreal. Um, it has uh, new twists and story beats and endings. Uh, it has uh, more endings than the original ones. So there are at least four new endings, um, or four endings in total. Um, it also has uh, a new orchestral score, new professional voice acting, new animations, and new gameplay mechanics. So I think the, the feedback we've got from testers so far is that um, it, it just feels like a whole new game. Um, so we've taken the, the best elements from the original and the best characters, um, and we've sort of just woven them into a, a wonderful new experience for people who enjoyed the mod to enjoy all over again. Now this project began as, as something that was it was pretty much just, just you and one other person, is that right? Uh, so it was just me, uh, although the mod was entirely my doing with the help of a composer and uh, some some voice actors. Um, this time around, I've, I've sort of built up the team a bit with the help of uh, Film Victoria and Epic. Um, so we've got a core team of four people. Um, so yeah, the production values are, I think, uh, much, much higher than the mod. Though we're still a very small team, we're just trying to punch above our weight with, you know, with what we've got. Can you speak a little bit about the the historical accuracy? I feel like you've got a you've got an impressive bookshelf behind you. Uh, how how much of <laughs> how strictly rooted in ancient room in ancient Rome is this? Uh, and how much kind of how many liberties did you take? It's a good question. So we have uh, we have engaged the services of a a wonderful historical consultant. Uh, I'm not quite ready to talk about him just yet, but I will say that he is an an Oxford scholar. He, uh, he teaches at Cambridge and he has been wonderfully helpful in helping us try to create a, a really uh, historically authentic world to the extent that that's allowed by the story. Obviously, you know, there are, there's time travel involved uh, and, and, and aspects of mythology. So uh, certainly not historically accurate, but uh, in, in terms of the environment and the costumes and the, the, the character backstories, we're, we're aiming for um, uh, historical authenticity. Now, obviously, you have a lot of freedom uh, when you're, you know, building something completely from the ground up, and it's and it's, you know, not, you know, modifying something. Uh, was there anything you were particularly excited about being able to do and, and having the sort of the freedom to put into the game uh, that you would have liked to have, have have around the first time around? That's now here in the standalone. Yeah, that's a great question. So, 
I like to think of the the game as you know the, the story we always wanted to tell for exactly that reason because we're able to do things with Unreal Engine that, that I couldn't have dreamed of with a mod. And I also like to, to think that uh, uh, the you know making a making a new game as opposed to making a mod is a bit like uh, um, building a house as opposed to, to putting an extension on an existing house. You just have you know, you, you, there's so much more to do and it requires an enormous amount of work, but at the same time you have, uh, you know, much more creative freedom. Um, and so, yeah, one of the one of the gameplay mechanics uh, that we've built is uh, is around the, the golden rule. So in, in the, I have to explain it a little bit. The, the, the backstory is that um, in the city, uh, if, if anyone commits a sin, everybody dies. Um, and so that was the case in the life, it's the case of the game. Uh, although in the game, uh, we call it the golden rule. And so um, what happens is that uh, when, when somebody commits a sin, uh, the, uh, the, the earth rumbles and a, a, a great booming voice bellows out and, and um, the, the lighting changes and all these golden statues come to life and start firing golden bows at people. Um, <laughs> And so, um, so what happens when a person is hit with a golden bow uh, or a golden arrow is that uh, gold sort of creeps over their skin, and they sort of they, they slowly sort of melt into a, a golden statue. Um, it's a really cool effect, and you, you've got to see it. Um, and and that's something that we could never have done with uh, without Unreal Engine. Um, in fact, when I when I said to my programmer that that's what I wanted to do, I really didn't think it was going to be possible, but. And he just looked at me and said, "Yeah, we can do that." And so, yeah, it was. That is, it, was uh, it was done within a day. It's very cool. That's awesome. Uh, <clears throat> now we've seen a lot of people. I mean, obviously, the modding community is huge. We've seen, uh, you know, games that let people make games, like Mario Maker, Dreams, for instance. Uh, do you have any advice for people who are, you know, getting their feet wet, you know, building a game within another game, uh, who might eventually want to break that out and create a game of their own separately? Do you have any tips from your experience you could pass on? Uh, good question. Um, look, I think, I, I think, um, I mean, mm, I'd say if you, if you're serious about turning your idea into a, a standalone game, um, it, it, it is an extremely difficult path. I've been very fortunate in that I've had assistance from, uh, Film Victoria, uh, a, a state government arts body, and also, um, uh, Epic, Epic uh, gave us a grant which helped us going. Um, you know, when you're developing an, an indie game, it's a little bit like um, one of those levels of Mario where you, you're running along and the platform is disintegrating beneath you and you've just got to keep going fast enough that you can kind of find safe ground. It, it, it's, it's a lot like that. And, and Epic's funding, you know, gave us the, uh, the, the ground that we needed to, to get to where we are and eventually land a publishing deal. Um, so look, it's not for the faint-hearted. Um, it's, it's extremely risky, uh, but certainly from my perspective, it's, it's the most um, you know, rewarding thing I've ever done um, to, to, make, to make a game. It's just a, it's a bit of a, it's a dream come true for me. Um, so I'd say, you know, if, if that's something that you're interested in doing, um, you should, uh, you know, you should do your best to, to to act professionally from the very beginning. I think there's a, the modern community is a, a wonderful um, engine of creativity, uh, but I think sometimes it can be, um, it, it, you know, it can lack a, a bit of polish. So yeah, I think if, if you are serious about turning your mod into a standalone game, then you should try to act professionally from the very beginning, try to get as much coverage as you can, um, and then, um, yeah, take it from there. Nice. Well, the good news is the the end is in sight, and the Forgotten City is is coming out very soon. Uh, do you have a, a release date yet, or a window? Yeah, so the window is a winter twenty twenty. It's coming to PC and Xbox. Nick, thank you so much for the grand tour of the Forgotten City. We're all looking forward to checking it out in the near future. Thanks so much. Complete strangers brought together by the fates to live out our days in a paradise we can never leave. Welcome back to check out this game on IGN Summer of Gaming, highlighting exciting under the radar games worth your attention. This next one is particularly exciting for me because it's basically what happens when you take a turn-based earthbound inspired RPG and somehow make that 
even weirder. Take a look at some exclusive gameplay of Knuckle Sandwich. Like what you see? Then head on over to IGN.com or YouTube.com slash IGN to watch the full extended version of this gameplay. Thanks for rocking with us here at IGN Summer of Gaming. Follow us on TikTok and search IGN Summer of Gaming hashtag. Watch us on channel IGN1 on your Samsung TV+. Plus. Leave us a yappa. Yap, yap, yap. Donate at donate.igen.com, all of that. And while you do, we'll keep things rolling. See, it was a joke, it was a joke with a payoff. Uh, with recompile and upcoming an upcoming 3D Metroidvania with hints of Tron, Cyberpunk, and some classic platforming action thrown in. Damon got a chance to chat with one of the developers about it, so let's take a look. Welcome back to Agent Summer of Gaming. I'm Damon Hatfield, and now I'm joined by Fee from Fee Games to talk about Recompile. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. How's it going, Damon? It's great. Uh, so Recompile looks very cool. Um, this is a 3D Metroidvania game that takes place inside a computer. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a virtual world, um, kind of inspired by... Uh, uh, you know, kind of sci-fi films like Tron and like old TV series like Reboot. I really wanted to make a game about a virtual world where you're kind of stuck inside a computer. Uh, so that's kind of the setting for it. Right. And we are actually uh, a virus that's sort of infiltrating the network? Yeah, correct. So you're a computer virus and you've been installed into this uh, mysterious computer system. You don't really know what the uh, purpose of the, uh, the computer is or why you're there or what exactly you're there to infect. Uh, and that's kind of the... Uh, the journey that you'll be discovering uh, as you play the game. And we are almost immediately discovered by this uh, sort of floating Death Star-ish orb. What can you tell us about, <laughs> about yeah, that that's character? The, uh, that's, the, that's basically the game's uh, 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 antagonist. Uh, gotcha. It's called the Hypervisor. Hmm. And um, so the Hypervisor essentially is a, uh, it's a program that's created by humans um, there to maintain the system. Um, but it's been abandoned for uh, decades. But because the, uh, the time uh, runs a lot uh, faster inside a computer uh, mm. because of you know CPU cycles and, and stuff. Sure. Obviously, <laughs> um, the uh, hypervisor's kind of been left there alone for thousands of years, and uh, so he's uh, he's really surprised uh, seeing you <laughs> in the kind sure. of shape of a human. Yeah. So talk about our character. Uh, I think you, you've you've described it as the character is only made up of effects. Yeah. Um, so the character design. I mean, we never had a character designer. Uh, when we first prototyped the game um, but my business partner he's uh, a vfx artist and animator um, so we decided oh why not make a, a character just purely out of vfx and uh, see what <laughs> happens and we did and we posted it on twitter and it got twelve thousand likes and um, it was from that point we were like okay i guess we're making this game yeah well it makes for a very it makes for a very unique looking character to control <laughs> thank you thank you um what's up with some of the uh what's up with the sort of vibrating backgrounds is that just part to so, show us um, that? Go ahead. 
Yeah, it's a show that, you know, part of the world is corrupted, uh, but also as you kind of explore the world, the uh, the, the vibrating meshes, uh, if you like, uh, start mm -hmm. to build up and, and, and collapse into the actual level geometry. And that's to kind of uh, tell you, like, you, you're there to, to perhaps uh, decorrupt the world. And it's a good way of showing where you've been and where you haven't as well. Interesting. So this being a Metroidvania game, you are uh, legally required to include a double jump. And I think that's <laughs> what we just received right here. Is that correct? Yeah, there we go. Uh, so <laughs> we have the typical Metroidvania abilities, but there's also a few unique ones in there as well, which uh, you know we're really proud of. I believe you said the inspiration for this world was uh, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Could you explain <laughs> how so? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I want to be completely um, you know, honest with you. It's, it's a big inspiration uh, for the game. I really love the kind of emergent mechanics of gameplay, uh, and we want uh, to cre recreate that in, uh, in Wukumpal as well. Um, one of the main mechanics in the game is the ability to hack everything. And we hope that players will find solutions to puzzles that even, you know, the developers haven't um, thought of ourselves. So that would be interesting to see. Hmm. And what was that that we just saw, sort of the uh, the lights that were wrapping around that tube? So that's the, uh, it's what's called the, the logic gate circuit. So the entire world is um, kind of uh, powered by these um, dynamic logic gates uh, and everything is uh, completely systemic. So we don't hard code anything in the game, you know, there's no code that says if you press this button a door will open it's all connected via these these logic gates and that's what makes the world so hackable as well and it looks like we're getting another power here i think a, a little bit ago uh you know there's a lot of platforming there's a lot of verticality to this world but it looks like we took f a little bit of fall damage a few minutes ago is that right yeah that's right yeah um you know it's it's a good way of, of stopping the player from from exploring too much too early on um, sure. But also the fall damage kind of scales as you progress through the game. So eventually, if you can imagine, you, you'll be able to explore the, the entire of the vertical world, uh, depending on what abilities you have. So now I have a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. Uh, what do we need to know about this? It looks like, do we have infinite ammo? Uh, so in this kind of uh, footage, there, there is infinite ammo, uh, just to oh. keep things simple. But the uh, there, there are kind of forms of currency or resources in the game that you collect called bits uh, and you need to harvest them and we, we use those for hacking for uh, other powerful abilities and, uh, and ammo as well so um, there will be some kind of resource management and choices to make there interesting are we actually looking at like the opening moments of the game so this is kind of a hybrid between what we think would be very similar to the opening of the game and a uh, kind of a vertical slice that we we like to show um to kind of a, you know the public uh if they're interested in the game uh it's also something that we would like to show at events as well obviously uh <laughs> physical events are few and far between these days but uh, this sure. was, uh, originally the plan for it, yeah. and uh speak to what's happening here it looks like uh these flying devices were blocking somewhere we need to get to is that right yeah, so they're um, sitting on these kind of switches. Uh, mm. So part of the uh, kind of puzzle solving the game is like you learn to uh, not only activate a switch, but also to deactivate them as well, based on what logic is powering the circuit. So they're, they're for this, for example, there's three switches and they all need to be unpressed in order to gain the next ability, which uh, you'll see here. Mm. Let's see what ability this is. Oh, I think I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we also saw um, some slowing down time. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that, but I haven't seen yeah, so, that ability. Uh, no, it's just something that I like to include in videos because it, uh, it, you know, it looks nice. It, it shows off the, yeah. the combat really well. Um, but we do have a uh, time hack ability in the game, mm. um, and that is, uh, you know, allows the player to to improve the precision on aiming as well as um, other kind of time related puzzles as well. I see. Uh, so yeah, that last power we got was the dash. So in like under eight minutes, uh, we've already gotten three new powers here. Um, but I think as you were saying, this is sort of a, a truncated demo, right? The actual game yeah, yeah. won't move quite this quickly. No, I mean, uh, we, you know, we're, we have, it's a full Metrovania game. There's uh, mm -hmm. some real pacing to it. So we wouldn't get 10 abilities in 10 minutes, but for, for this, uh, for this demonstration today, I just wanted to show, you know, how, how cool some of the abilities look mm -hmm. and, and how fun to play. The dash actually you can use uh, for combat as well. So if you kind of dash gotcha. into enemies, you can uh, destroy them. And I, th I think you've said before, you want to be the first ever Metroidvania that has branching narrative. Can you speak to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so plenty of Metroidvanias that I've played are all pretty linear in the way that mm -hmm. you have to collect ability A, B, C to progress through the game. Um, so we wanted to support like multiple play styles, you know, whether you like combat or traversal or hacking. And the um, 
depending on which abilities that you choose to get, gives you uh, options on uh, what route to take throughout the world, and then ultimately that will give the player a reason to change the narrative of the game as well. Um, so the idea of We Paul is you're there to help create the first sentient AI, um, but what kind of AI you create depends on how you play. So if you're an aggressive player, you can imagine what kind of uh, AI you would be creating at the end. Well, I think Recompile looks really cool. Uh, I can't wait to play it. What is the release plan? Uh, so we are currently in the final uh, stages of uh, polishing and uh, fixing bugs. And then we are planning to release the game on uh, PC and Steam um, at the end of the year, uh, holiday season. And we're also looking at opportunities with next gen uh, consoles as well. But we, uh, we currently don't have anything to announce today. Gotcha. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us today for iTunes Summer of Gaming. Recompile looks awesome. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. That was Recompile. And now our producer is asking us to use that as a segue to recompile our social and charity information. Very sorry. Here goes. Don't forget, you can follow IGN on TikTok and search IGN Summer of Gaming hashtag for exclusive bonus content and to upload your own gameplay clips. And all Summer of Gaming long, we're asking you to donate to the World Health Organization and Bail Project by following the links in the video description. By donating, you'll have a chance to win codes for games like Resident Evil 3 or swag from companies like Bethesda. Donors who give more than $50 will have a chance to win a custom Summer of Gaming Xbox One X. Not bad. Now it's time for a quick break, but when we return, we've got a whole bunch of games from Humble Bundle and exclusive gameplay from Core Punk, plus more from SpongeBob later on. Stay tuned. IGN Summer of Gaming is presented by The Last of Us Part 2, available June 19th, rated M for Mature. By the Army National Guard, working in our communities throughout the COVID pandemic to deliver food, build hospitals, and more. Go to nationalguard.com slash esports for more info. And by Fuser, who will be partying with us all summer long. Everybody loves watching a speed run of their favorite game. But what if you got the opportunity to peek into the minds of the developers while they watch their games getting completely wrecked? That's exactly what happens in every episode of Game Devs React to speedruns. Yeah, you can do that. Oh my god! <laughs> we invite you to ride along with the developers as they react to, question, and enjoy some of the most skilled players exploiting and speeding through a game it took years of their life to create. Join us every Saturday for a new episode. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. The next generation of video gaming is on the horizon, and IGN is here to bring you the latest PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X news and analysis in our new weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch 2020. We'll bring on the experts to discuss and analyze all the latest developments around these new consoles. From frame rates, services, features, peripherals, and even all the new tech jargon, Next Gen Console Watch 2020 will keep you up to speed on everything leading up to the next generation of gaming. Join us every Friday for a new episode. News, Games, and More is IGN's live news show every day of the week that covers all the day's news about games, movies, comics, and of course, more. This is our daily live show that takes a rotating cast of IGN talent going over all the latest news of the day while taking live questions and comments from chat. We're live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, and you can find us on Mixer.com slash IGN, YouTube.com slash IGN, and Twitch.tv slash IGN. See you there. Welcome back. A little later, we'll have a SpongeBob rehydrated Let's Play. But next up, here's the latest from our pals over at Humble Bundle, plus never before seen gameplay from Core Punk, a promising new top down MMO RPG.
I'm joined today by Eugene Kiver. Thanks for, for talking with us. So let's start with uh, the most basic of basic questions. What is Core Punk? What is this game you guys are working on? In a nutshell, uh, Core Punk is a top-down uh, MMO RPG in a vast, seamless open world with fog of war. Like initially, we thought we really wanted to have this experience of having of playing with fog of war in an open world, and we weren't able to found a find it any any other place. So we decided to build this game. And and this is like a a traditional MMO, right? Like this will be a large explorable world. Lately, there's a lot of uh, instance-based games and session-based games, and there's not a lot of like classic MMOs. I mean, where you can meet a, like a thousand, thousands of people on persist in persistent world. So yeah, that's pretty traditional MMO RPG. And, and you mentioned it already, but this was something I did want to talk about, which was uh, the Fog of War specifically. You know, Fog of War is is something we usually see in stuff like RTSs, that sort of thing, not really like MMO. What What is, wh why was it important to you to include this? Why did you want to see a, an MMO with Fog of War like this? And kind of what, is it, what does it bring to Core Punk? Well, it creates all, a, a lot of these uh, encounters that you would not expect to get in, in, in a game where you see like four kilometers in front of you. You don't know what will what awaits you behind the next corner, like what will happen. You can meet a, a foe, you can get into the fight because we have a, this open world PVP, so you can get attacked anywhere in the world or you can build this, create these ambushes on other people or you can meet a friend who like, you, you can meet someone in the forest, you have chat to him and, and, and become friends for, 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 for a very long time. You don't know what awaits for, to you. Like. And let's, let's talk about the, some of those environments that you'll be discovering under Fog of War too, because you just mentioned one is like, something I noticed back when your, your gameplay reveal trailer back in December, I believe it was, uh, yeah. you, there's a ton of visual variety in this game. You know, it's, it's one moment you're looking at like steampunk style trains, another moment you're in like a neon cyberpunk city, and then another you're in more of a traditional, you know, fantasy based MMO forest fighting creatures. So like, what are what are some of the themes you'll you'll see in, in Corpon? Yeah, um, actually the trailer was kind of packed with all these you know, environments. So yeah, uh, in an actual game, they are much more spread out uh, all in the world. But uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's four basic cultures and themes we wanted to see in core punk that's monopunk which like fantasy basically um, um this cyberpunk steampunk and uh, post-apocalyptic uh, diesel punk so but the there are cities of these cultures are, are really like far apart so you would not they're not be like blended in 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 one city but there's kind of eclectic. There's a lot of mix of cultures in, in, in a game, and and that so that was like an explicit goal was to to sort of focus around. I mean, I know the name is core punk, uh, so it was really to kind of go around these different sort of punky ideas. Yeah, at some point we just realized that there's a lot of punk styles in, in a game, and uh, uh, this world of core punk, uh, its lore is that it is like a cradle of life and uh, basically it's just a core for, for everything. So we decided to just call it core punk. And switching to the actual uh, meat of the game, the actual things like combat classes, how, how, do you, how does core punk handle sort of the, the more like a traditional MMO class system, something like that? We have four archetypes. Um, those are uh, tank, heal, uh, damage dealer, and support. Like support is getting much more attention lately in uh, uh, session-based games, so we're fans of that that archetype too. So we decided to add this class. And in terms of how you would select your class, we have uh, twelve heroes and six that we are focusing on on to bring into close beta. And each hero has three weapon masteries, and basically each weapon mastery is your class. So, yeah, you have, that's, that's how it works. So there's uh, 12 heroes, each with three weapon masteries. So that's a lot of kind of choice in sort of how you, how you 
decide to bring your character. Yes, that, that's a lot. But like, for example, you can be like, not all classes are in one character, right? There's just only three weapon masters, but basically kind of, kind of weapon you can use with that hero. And you can switch between them and uh, upgrade them. Yeah, but that, there's a lot of like uh, distinct you know, fighting styles in, in a game with, with the, that many characters and, and three masteries each, yeah. So I gotta ask, if there is a more, like a healing archetype and a support archetype, how do the how do the two differ? Because a lot of times those those two are sort of interchangeably used. Yeah, but uh, support is more about controls, helping people, and uh, you know that if you're in a raid, your primary goal is to heal. But support can uh, stop someone, can help you. So it's just more diversity is is is, is more diverse. Yeah. A lot more utility, more, yeah. more than just straight up keeping people alive. Cool. Yeah. Uh, what about the combat specifically, too? Because it, you know, in some of the gameplay you've already shown off, and and it, it's, you know, you've got a lot of like uh, big red circles that you have to dodge out of the way of that sort of thing. It seems very action packed, very kind of dynamic, rather than just uh, right click and and take your hands off of the controls and be done. Yeah, like in a lot of MMOs, you get to the cap level and you're not interested in an open world anymore. So there's just mobs that are staying like in, at some spots and you just hit everything you have, like all spawn all your abilities and you, you kill them. And we really wanted to make this part of the, of the game interesting, also interesting to uh, high level players. So each camp, it, it consists of different mobs, and it just they get rearranged each time you 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 kill them off. So they work; they actually work together. They some of them keep distance to you know, like range type. Um, some of them will heal other parts of of, of of that camp. So they're help and they cooperate. And you yeah, you have to move. And we really wanted to make it. A, like a part of the game because it's much more interesting and so that that's also sounds like enemy variety is kind of or, or enemy variety and also enemy behavior is pretty important in that uh can you tell me a little bit kind of how you're, you're tackling enemies and and the things you'll actually be going up against some enemies can have different abilities abilities every time they're spawned so like for example uh, a zombie for example he, he can for you. after you kill kill him it will explode, for example, and, and you did not expect that from, from him. So you, uh, some will like uh, use, uh, like, like for example, freeze you for, and they'll, they'll give levers to other like, mobs to, 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 to attack you while you're, while you're frozen. So they're, so they're different every time you, you don't know, you usually don't know what, you have to adjust your tactics every time. Every time you meet a camp, you need to think about whether you have to how would you approach it? And what about, um, I know this is early since you guys aren't even in beta yet, so it's it's sort of maybe jumping the gun a little bit to talk about this, but what is, you mentioned sort of like in some other MMOs, these high, these mobs just sort of like being there for high level players. What do you guys imagine the, the end game of Warpunk looks like? You know, are you gonna have these giant raids? Are you gonna expect people to go into PVP? Well, how, how do you hope for like dedicated players to be engaging with it for a long time? Yeah, that, that's actually a problem for a lot of modern MMOs that they have too much of, of uh, too little basically of, of uh, high-end content. Basically, forty percent of our game is is for you to get to the cap level, and after that, sixty percent of the game is high-level content. And it's yeah, it's open world. It's, it's like vast wilderness where you can find like rare monsters, rare world bosses that's dungeons that's randomly generated dungeons and, and custom dungeons um there's also raids and uh, um arenas battlegrounds just a plenty of things to do basically well great eugene thank you so much for joining us telling us all about core punk uh it was a pleasure to have you on
We are nearing the end of our fourth IGN Expo, but there's plenty of great Summer of Gaming content to come. Today alone, we'll have a special Xbox One X update and an exclusive SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated Let's Play. Not to mention our Animal Crossing charity stream tomorrow, where our pal Brian Altano will be touring a bunch of celebrity islands in Animal Crossing New Horizons. You can catch it wherever you stream IGN or on channel IGN1 on your Samsung TV+. Plus. All right, let's end Expo 4 strong. What's on deck? Destroy All Humans, the game, not the directive. Destroy All Humans abducted its way into fans' hearts with a zany style and chaotic alien invasion-themed mayhem. It's now been completely rebuilt from the ground up for modern platforms. Let's check it out. Destroy All Humans is the upcoming open-world sci-fi action-adventure reboot of the classic 2005 game, and I can't wait to learn more about it, so here to help me do just that is Dennis Scheifer and Stefan Schmitz from Black Forest Games. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. It's good to see you. Uh, so we have been tracking this game for a long time here at IGN, uh, big fans, me particularly because I think this does a really good job of sort of fusing comedy and chaos, which is two of my favorite genres uh, in all of life. Um, and so we saw this game, you know, you were showing it off around the convention cycle last year. What's what's new this time around? Like what 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 are the what, sort of the new additions that you guys are kind of proud of here? I mean, the first thing that is new that we have a release date, so it's coming out on the 28th <laughs> of July. Um, so many people were waiting for this. Um, and of course, we now uh, have done the whole production and um, kind of can tell you a bit more about um, the changes we did to the original and what we kept. And I think Stefan, as our assistant creative director, um, might be best to talk about that. Yeah, sure. Um... We uh, largely the, uh, the the development since we since we showed it off last time. I think it was a three last year. Was um, that uh, we uh, we applied a very a very strong level of polish to everything. The VFX look more crisp right now. Um, the uh, the the gameplay has has. Uh, was now smoothed. We we took actually some feedback that we got from earlier from earlier uh, interviews and from from fans when we showed off a few things in our trailers, and uh, improved a bit on our PK system. It's now it's now really fun to just toss around things and make them exactly land where you want them to uh, where you want them to land. Also a few additions. Uh, also a few of the additions uh, that uh, that are very apparent is, for example, um, how we how we. Uh, how we let uh, the synergies between weapons and psycho and psi abilities uh, work together. For example, uh, with the iron detonator, Crypto's signature grenade throwing weapon was an extremely nice detonation and uh, a disintegration factor to it. Uh, if you toss a grenade, uh, if you shoot a grenade with that thing and you pick it immediately up with PK afterwards, you can basically fling it and toss it like a dart or <laughs> it feels more like a rocket launcher when you use PK on it. So essentially you turn one weapon into two different weapons by just trying out to fiddle around with your psychokinetic abilities around it. So that's a big part of this is sort of combining systems to create mayhem. And they make, a, you know, there's a lot of open world games where you are rebuilding things or bringing people together, you know, doing objectives that are sort of a little bit more peaceful. This is uh, obviously just about destruction. It's in, literally in the title of the game. So how's, how, how is it to sort of nail that feeling of just pure mayhem? Like what's, what's the most important thing to get right when you want players to really get in there and just wreck shop? Um, I, think the, I think, yeah, you go, well, go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, so I think uh, one of our biggest focus was the controls of the game. We wanted um, the player to always feel in control and to always uh, know what he has to do to achieve the kind of destruction he wants to achieve. Um, so we spent a lot of time uh, optimizing and then looking also at later uh, installments of the original games, how they already found solutions for control let's say, let's say issues or criticism that people had for the first game. So we took all into that into consideration um, and to really focus on smooth controls and uh, a fluid gameplay. So that was one of, yeah. 
Now, like in terms of traversal, I think what I really dig about this game uh, that's super cool to me is the sort of the platforming feel of it. It's, you know, it f almost feels grounded in traditional pr platformers, which obviously the original game kind of came out right at the tail end of that kind of renaissance of 3D platforming games. Uh, tell me a little about traversal, because we're obviously seeing, you know, jet hacking, double jumping. It looks like almost rocket shoes. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of really cool ways to get around in this game. Yeah, we uh, what we were looking at when we when we started the development of the game is we were looking not only at uh, Destroy All Humans uh, one, but also the whole series as a whole. And one thing that was very apparent to us when we looked at Destroy All Humans one and two is is essentially this um, this this power fantasy of being that that the alien invader, uh, and how much how much how much fun it is to essentially domineer your your foes with these with these fun powers and we have the feeling uh, we have the feeling to actually build up upon them make the jetpack which is one of the most signature things feel fast powerful and 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 really cool to use uh, as you can as you can see here right now in the example um the zippy all, all the zipping around uh, which is then uh, which you then can uh, switch into a focus mode when you play with a gamepad to essentially sail around uh, around enemies uh it, it makes it makes it feel really really fast very fast paced but you're totally in control about that and to to uh, play on top of that and put it into a modern in a modern sense, in a modern setting of, of, of modes of locomotion and transportation, we added uh, we added an additional dash, which is also doubling as an evasive ability if you're under fire, and the uh, skate ability, which is an upgrade you can simply attach to crypto and go like like skating on on this kind of psi hover cushion, while you while you either enjoy the view or try to get fast from A to B. God, I love it. Uh, yeah, I love it so much. This is, I mean, this is exactly kind of what. Uh, I, I look for in open world games, right? It's it's this sort of uh, ability to just kind of approach things however I want. We saw an objective earlier that was basically like kill a human with a with a car, which you've done now several times during the length of this gameplay. What are what are your some some of your sort of like favorite weird objectives in this game, like the really crazy ones, without spoiling too much? <laughs> um, Stefan, I think you. I, th I think my favorite is right from Turnip Seed Farm. Um, <laughs> essentially, you have two additional objectives. One of them is, oh yeah, kill, kill those bovine creatures which are which are not reacting to the Furon invaders. And you go, okay, oh, drown a cow in the lake. Let's try this. PK and go, poof. That's the one. And the second one is, oh yeah, Martha Turnip Seed is still around when you have to kill the cops. So kill her with a chicken. <laughs> With a chicken? <laughs> oh boy, chickens are deadly throwing weapons. I love it so much. Oh, that's that is so awesome to hear. I wanted to ask about that too because it's sort of—I uh, mean, not about chickens, although we can we can always talk about chickens. Sure. But the uh, chickens are a sort of a classic comedy trope, and comedy is pretty tough in video game because uh, in video games because comedy is about timing. Uh, and in this game, I, I'm like cackling and laughing almost the entire time because of a lot of the sort of it's sort of almost vintage kind of Looney Tunes-esque comedy in this game. When you zap a car, it, it jiggles, and then you electrocute somebody and you see their whole skeleton. What were some of your sort of comedy influences for this game, and how do you get comedy right in a video game? I mean, the, the great thing we had, we had great material to work with. Um, the, the whole storyline, uh, the voiceovers, the way the voiceovers were done already kind of inspired uh, the whole team to, to find more in that, in that area. Um, so and you're absolutely right. It's a lot about timing. It's a lot about how it actually looks. Then I mean, there, for example, there was a long discussion: uh, what art style we should go for? Should we go for a bit more realistic? Should we go for the art style that we then chose now, which is a bit more cartoony? Um, and the humor was one of the main aspects why we decided to go for a bit more cartoony style, um, yep. since I think it lends itself better to make the game fun and not too serious. Um, I mean, it's a game about destroying all humans. And <laughs> if you would have done this, you know, in, in a super realistic style, I don't know if it would have had the same charm as it does now. Now, the vehicular combat is amazing. I love I love the absolute destruction that's happening right now. Uh, tell me about some of the weapons there. We just saw, this is, is this just basically like a massive laser beam flamethrower that, that can do graffiti on the ground? <laughs> That, uh, I mean, that weapon is. Yeah. You go first. You go first. <laughs> um, I mean, 
uh, the name says it all. It's the death ray, uh, and that's what its job is. Um, so yeah. So what we added is that you can also you know shoot just uh, downwards from UFO instead of just forwards, just to kind of uh, go with the whole UFO trope a bit more. Um, yeah. So that is it's the main weapon you have from the beginning. Um, but you also have then the uh, quantum deconstructor and the sonic boom. I hope I said the right ones now. <laughs> uh, Stefan, correct me if I didn't. Um, <laughs> Qu quantum yeah, deconstructor and sonic boom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, you you occasionally feel bad about what you're doing here, I imagine, but uh, ultimately, like you are playing sort of as the bad guy. But there's a motivation there, right? Like it's not just pure chaos or am i inventing that is this is this dude just ready to wreck shop no no the, the furons yes. have a mission um the furons are on earth to collect furon dna that has been intermingled with the uh, human dna a long time ago when uh sailors so to say from the furons were on shore leave on earth and uh, did what sailors do then um and so the furon race as they um only uh <laughs> as they clone themselves and this degrades their DNA, they're at the point where their DNA is not strong enough anymore. So they need this fresh, uh, old kind of human DNA and that's their mission. That's the main reason why they're on Earth. Yeah, I, lo I love that. So you're also, while saving a race. Oh, no, that's great. While you were, you're saving a race while you're destroying uh, sort of like a, a <laughs> classic donut, donut shop, which I like. I was I was wondering how that building particularly would explode and seeing the donut just soar into the air and land back in the fire <laughs> is just like, it warms my heart. I mean, it breaks my heart too, because I love donuts, but um, how, how, like, how much, how much fun are you guys having just sort of deciding how you want things to explode and the the physics in which certain parts break off and you know things burst into flames and stuff like that because it, it seems like you're having a blast uh, ab ab absolutely it is a blast but um as, as with games development this is a lot of meetings a lot of sitting together and thinking about how how can we how can we transport it how can we be stay true to the to the identity of this game and and kind of ramp it a bit up to 11, but not too much. So we try really to, f we try with our with our designs and our implementations to find the sweet spot really that is kind of complementing the original game, but on the other hand feels so natural. Like um, Dennis, Dennis uh, has always coined the phrase for us. Uh, we're not making a remake uh, of the original game. We're making a remake of the memories players have of that game. And I think we did a great job with that. So one, one really important aspect to get the humor right in the game is to actually give the, the animators and the technical artists the freedom um, to look, to, to make choices and to see how they can actually uh, infuse humor in the, the work they're doing at that moment. And that was one really important thing that we made sure our team had. No, I love it. Um, no, thank you guys so much. I think this is the kind of game the world needs right now. It's a little bit of uh, chaos that we can actually take control of ourselves. Uh, thank you guys so much. Destroy All Humans is out on PC, PS4, Xbox One, and Stadia on July 28th, which is incredibly soon. I'm very excited for it. All right, thanks so much. We look forward to hearing more about Destroy All Humans in the future. I can't believe it. That's it for IGN Expo number four. We are done. That is all the games that anyone will ever make or talk about, and yet somehow IGN Summer of Gaming continues. After the break, we'll have a very deep dive into SpongeBob SquarePants, The Battle for Bikini Bottom, Rehydrated. That title is too long. And then keep an eye out for more charity speedruns, our celebrity Animal Crossing Island Tour stream on June 16th, and plenty of other stuff coming up. There's also our special Xbox Series X smart delivery update, Chad Michael Collins guesting on tomorrow's news games and more. Our interview with Tony Hawk at the end of the day today, we pulled out every stop we could find and we're hoping you'll do the same when it comes to donating to our two great causes, the COVID-19 relief fund and the bail project. You can do that by following the links in the video description or head on over to donate.ign.com. Visit IGN for the full schedule and for even more summer of gaming goodness, download the TikTok app Follow IGN and search for IGN's Summer of Gaming hashtag, where you can watch along with live events and submit your own Summer of Gaming moments, reactions, and plays. Or leave us a Yappa video comment at IGN.com and your Yap could show up on the stream. 
For now, we've got an exclusive interview with Jason Arnold from Team Xbox, breaking down smart delivery on the Series X. And right after that, we'll hop over to Bikini Bottom with Miranda and Akeem. All of that right after the break. See you next time, and thanks for watching. IGN Summer of Gaming is presented by the Army National Guard, working in our communities throughout the COVID pandemic to deliver food, build hospitals, and more. Go to nationalguard.com slash esports for more info. News, games, and more is IGN's live news show every day of the week that covers all the day's news about games, movies, comics, and of course, more. This is our daily live show that takes a rotating cast of IGN talent, going over all the latest news of the day while taking live questions and comments from chat. We're live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, and you can find us on Mixer.com slash IGN, YouTube.com slash IGN, and Twitch.tv slash IGN. See you there. The next generation of video gaming is on the horizon, and IGN is here to bring you the latest PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X news and analysis in our new weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch 2020. We'll bring on the experts to discuss and analyze all the latest developments around these new consoles. From frame rates, services, features, peripherals, and even all the new tech jargon, Next Gen Console Watch 2020 will keep you up to speed on everything leading up to the next generation of gaming. Join us every Friday for a new episode. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, let's plays, and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app, YouTube, Facebook, or Snapchat, we've always got you covered. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. Hey everybody, welcome to IGN Summer of Gaming. I'm Bo Moore, the executive editor for tech here at IGN. And today I am joined by Jason Ronald, the partner director of program management for Xbox and one of the lead engineers on the Xbox Series X. Jason, thanks for joining me. Hey Bo, really nice to be here. So today we are talking about uh, the Series X's smart delivery feature. Uh, could you just give me a quick overview of how smart delivery works? Sure. So smart delivery is really designed to make sure that people have confidence in whatever games that they purchase today. If the game has actually been enhanced for the Xbox Series X, they get that version of the game for free when they choose to upgrade to Xbox Series X. So we, it's a technology that we developed and all of our first party Xbox Game Studios titles will be leveraging smart delivery moving forward. And we've also offered this to all the partners across the ecosystem. And we're really excited by the titles and the partners have jumped on board to make sure that they're providing the best experience possible for players on Xbox Series X. Awesome. So uh, is there like a time limit for how long this cross-generation offer lasts? No, this is this is part of the permanent offering. So once you go ahead and purchase a game, say on Xbox One, you can pick and choose when you choose to upgrade to Xbox Series X, and we'll guarantee that we'll always make sure that we have the best version waiting for you. Obviously, this will support all first-party games, but it's something that developers have to buy into. So for games that are current-gen Xbox One games, but that might not have smart delivery, will those still be playable on the Series X? Absolutely. As part of our commitment to compatibility, the thousands of games that run on Xbox One today will all run on Xbox Series X. But if a developer's actually gone back and enhanced or optimized their title for Xbox Series X, when you uh, title adopts smart delivery, when you jump into playing that game on the Xbox Series X, we'll download that version that's been optimized and enhanced for develop by the developer, and you will make sure that you have the best version. Cool. So tell me more from a technical standpoint of what 
what really goes into that that optimized for Xbox for Series X? I mean, uh, what what really are the things that will make a difference between the that optimized version versus just the uh, backwards compatible version? So there's a whole uh, breadth of new capabilities that are only possible on the Xbox Series X. Things like hardware accelerated ray tracing or games that choose to run at 60 frames a second or higher. So if a developer actually goes back and takes full advantage of those capabilities, but they want to make sure that they're providing the same great experience and allowing players to play together, as well as moving all the progression forward, We've provided all of the platform technology on the back end to make that super seamless for the developer. And then from a player, you have confidence that you can be playing your favorite game today. You can choose to upgrade to the Xbox Series X and all of your progression moves forward with you and you can just pick up and play directly from where you left off. Similarly, if you choose to say you have another Xbox console in your house, let's say you have an Xbox One S, in another room, you can easily jump between both consoles, can keep playing as you see fit, and then your progression moves forward with you. So from a technical standpoint, what kind of development work has to actually go into uh, for the developers to make a game smart delivery compatible? So for smart delivery itself, it's actually super simple. All the developer has to do is upload their optimized version of the Xbox Series X version of the game, and then we handle all of the complexity on the back end. So it's really about empowering the developer and letting the developer determine how best to use all the power that's delivered in the Xbox Series X. They focus on making their game great, and then we handle all of the complexity on the back end on their behalf. So let's now look a little bit into the future. Uh, how, How long will Smart Delivery be supporting the current gen of Xbox games? So we ultimately, it's going to be up to each individual title to choose how they take the full advantage of Xbox Series X. And this is a platform capability that we have and it will be available throughout the generation. So if a developer chooses to continue to ship their title on the Xbox One generation, and then they have an enhanced version on the Xbox Series X, we'll continue to support that. You know, some titles will choose to really take full advantage of the Xbox Series X and make, you know, sometimes there's gonna be scenarios where they can only do deliver those on the Xbox Series X. And in those cases, once again, we'll make sure that you're always playing the best version of the game on whatever version of the console you choose to play on. Gotcha. So in that case, if uh, basically the the new version, the if it's only capable on Series X, that means that it won't be playable on current gen hardware. Is that right? Correct. Got it. Uh, cool. Well, that answers all of my questions. Thanks so much, Jason, for joining us here on Xbox on IGN Summer of Gaming. Uh, for more Xbox and more Summer of Gaming, keep it right here to IGN. IGN Summer of Gaming is presented by the Army National Guard, working in our communities throughout the COVID pandemic to deliver food, build hospitals, and more. Go to nationalguard.com slash esports for more info. We're happy to present IGN's Summer of Gaming, featuring the latest and greatest in game reveals, news, trailers, next-gen coverage, and more. Our month-long event features our first-ever series of IGN Expos, where you'll get first looks at world premiere game trailers, exclusive game demos, and interviews you won't find anywhere else. IGN's Summer of Gaming, only on IGN and IGN One on Samsung TV+. Tired of watching IGN on those tiny cell phones and tablets? Well, IGN is moving to your living rooms. Starting in June, tune into IGN One on your Samsung TV Plus to see all that IGN has to offer, beginning with our exclusive Summer of Gaming event. You'll get first looks at world premiere game trailers, exclusive game demos, and next-gen console coverage that you won't find on any other network, only on IGN One. The next generation of video gaming is on the horizon, and IGN is here to bring you the latest PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X news and analysis in our new weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch 
2020. We'll bring on the experts to discuss and analyze all the latest developments around these new consoles. From frame rates, services, features, peripherals, and even all the new tech jargon, Next Gen Console Watch 2020 will keep you up to speed on everything leading up to the next generation of gaming. Join us every Friday for a new episode. News, Games, and More is IGN's live news show every day of the week that covers all the day's news about games, movies, comics, and of course, more. This is our daily live show that takes a rotating cast of IGN talent, going over all the latest news of the day while taking live questions and comments from chat. We're live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, and you can find us on Mixer.com slash IGN, YouTube.com slash IGN, and Twitch.tv slash IGN. See you there. Well, Expo 4 is over, but IGN's Summer of Gaming is still heating up. I'm Akim Lawanson, and we're about to play SpongeBob SquarePants, The Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. You guys already know this title. It's an awesome 3D platformer now being remastered with a bunch of new modes and bonus content. And I honestly can't wait to get my hands on it. 